I wasn't sure where to tell this story, and I probably sound crazy. But this definitely happened. A while ago, I was on the bus back home with my little girl. We had just had a really fun day out. I felt this strong energy, and I wanted to investigate, but with my awkwardness, I just kept my head down. Although I kept thinking, what is it about that group of older women that was in the front? And why does it feel like this energy is coming from that direction? This was not just somebody giving off vibes. The feeling was so intense. I'm usually good at reading people, but this just hit different. It wasn't bad either. It felt warm, inviting, familiar, and so intense that it made the air around me feel tight, but not in a suffocating way, like a hug from your grandma. I decided to properly look, and this woman caught my attention straight away. Not long after, it was her stop, and I never saw her again. A week ago, on the way home again, I feel this energy again. I look up, and lo and behold, it's the same woman. At this point, the energy was so intense that I nearly got teary-eyed. She started to smile at me when I started feeling that way, but not in a creepy way, just kind of happy. She was sat on the folding down chairs at the front and kept looking down the aisle. I knew she was noticing me, but not making direct eye contact. It felt like she knew that I knew. I know this may sound ridiculous, and it was just based off of a feeling, but it's a feeling I haven't been able to shake. I'm still not entirely sure what happened, if anything. But it was interesting, and I wanted to share. For some background, whenever I took the bus for school, I was pretty much alone on bus rides. I was always on one of those small buses. We didn't have any other kids on there, but the highest amount of kids on the bus was probably around five, including me. I was the only one from my school on that bus. All of the other kids went to the same school, and it wasn't mine. Plus, I've had about four different bus drivers in my time. The one I'm going to talk about lost her husband about a year before, and she was out for a long time. She had just gotten back when this took place. This happened about four or five years ago, and I was still pretty young. For morning rides, we dropped off the other kids, and we were heading to my school. We were the only ones on the road when the bus suddenly stops on the side of the road. I was really confused. I thought maybe the bus had broken down, but being the shy kid that I was, I didn't say anything. I just waited. Then the bus driver opened the door. I started to feel a bit uneasy. We weren't at my school yet, and there was nobody there, so why was she opening it? She stared out the door for like two minutes when I finally said, are you okay? I asked, without looking away from the door, she said in such a low voice that it gave me chills, there's a man there. There was no man there, no person at all. She kept staring for a couple of seconds when she finally closed the door and continued driving down the road. She wasn't my bus driver after that year and I do miss her. She was a very sweet lady but that moment still freaks me out. I sometimes think that maybe the man she saw was her husband. I don't know who else she would open a school bus door to. I don't know why she would stop the bus in the first place, especially for a stranger. Maybe she saw her husband and it wasn't until after the door was open that she realized he was dead and that's why she stared. I don't really know what happened that day, but I'll never forget it.
I worked the late shift for this company about six years ago. I would get off at midnight and the company bus would take us home. My neighborhood was the farthest, so I would be brought home last. I should also mention that the road that this happened on has had multiple strange incidents, accidents, murders, ghostly sightings, strange creatures, just a whole lot of weird stuff. On the last part of the journey, there were three of us left on the bus. After the driver confirmed our addresses, we continued. I was at the front of the bus, a young lady in the middle and a guy at the back were the other two passengers. We got to the guy's street and the driver stopped and waited for him to get off. After getting impatient, the driver asked the lady to go check if he was sleeping. She came running back to the front of the bus, crying and praying. We asked her what was wrong, and she said that there was nobody back there, and she wanted to go home right now. The driver switched on the lights and floored it. It gets even creepier. After getting off on my street, I began to walk to my house. This was now at about two o'clock in the morning. Every dog that I would walk past kept staring at something behind me. When I turned to look, there was nothing. There was no shadow, no sound, no buddy. After getting inside my house, I looked out the window for the next 10 minutes. It was just dead silence and dogs staring at nothing. I've never been able to figure out what happened that night, but it was freaky. I'm a bus driver for TransLink, Bus 169. It goes through the Riverview Hospital complex in Coquitlam, BC. It's an abandoned mental asylum and hospital complex with most of its buildings run down and just a couple still in operation. It's actually the site of a lot of filming due to how eerie some of the buildings look. I was on my last shift of the night, always on edge, of course, because it's super eerie late at night there. Luckily, I had a couple at the back of the bus, so I wasn't exactly alone while driving through this place. As I was driving through, I saw a man sitting at the bus stop. Immediately, I was filled with dread because it was after midnight, and I doubted that somebody would randomly be waiting for a bus at this hour, especially since this complex was closed off to the public at 9 p.m. every day. So I had to do what I had to do, and I pulled over to let the man in. But the strange thing is, when I opened the door, there was no one there on the seat, and I was pretty sure I saw a person. So I just closed the door and gunned it. I was not going outside to check. That would be a rookie mistake. Anyway, I make it the rest of the route okay, and I pull up to the last stop at the bus loop. I disengaged the locking mechanism for the back door for the couple to get out. Then I heard a guy at the back say, what the? And I turned around and I saw the back door was open, but the couple was still making their way toward the door. Our buses are equipped with a pressure sensitive push bar that activates the door to open when pushed against it. I had disengaged the lock to allow the doors to be pushed open. I asked the couple what the problem was, but I already knew what it was before they said it. The door had opened by itself. I don't know if it was just a malfunction or what, and maybe it was a coincidence that it was the same night that I stopped the bus for a man who wasn't there. But maybe we had a ghost passenger that night. I'm not sure what to do about driving that route. I really don't want to anymore. When I was a kid, 
I was sitting in the back seat of my parents' car, traveling through a built-up area, when my brother, who was sitting next to me, suddenly cried out in fear. My mom was in the front passenger seat and quickly turned around to ask what the matter was. My brother said, I've just seen a woman standing in a bus shelter and she didn't have a face. He then went on to explain that where her face should have been, there was just a gaping hole, but it was glowing white. The bus shelter had been on my side of the road, but I had been looking out the front, so I never saw anything. I asked my mom if we could go back and see if the woman was still there, but my brother was genuinely scared and begged us not to. At the time, my mom said that she thought it was just her car's headlights flashing in the woman's face, but the way my brother was so scared definitely made me question that explanation. I'm a middle school teacher and coach in a rural area outside of San Antonio, Texas. As a part of my coaching contract, I have to get my CDL and bus my athletes to and from games. After our last game of the volleyball season, I was driving the bus back to the bus barn. It was around 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, so it was already super dark and there weren't many cars out. But I've driven this part a million times and I was just excited to return the bus and get home to my husband and dogs. The bus I had wasn't anything special. It was just an old sub bus from 2004. There are cameras inside that don't record audio, apparently, and a few switches were broken. But as long as the brakes worked and the bus got as close to 50 miles per hour as it could, it was perfect. I was approaching a bridge when a whispering voice began to speak through the radio. This didn't surprise me much because there's usually an interference near this bridge due to it being near the train tracks. Plus lots of cops hide here to catch speeders. I wasn't really familiar with the way these radios worked, but it helped me feel better about it. The closer I got to the bridge though, the louder the whisper through the radio was. I began to make out words like slow, sit, and no. As soon as I started to go underneath the bridge, I did a mirror check just to make sure I had enough room on the sides. Everything seemed normal, until I looked in the inside mirror that could see all of the seats behind me. Sitting in the very back row on my right was a figure. It was pure black, just a black abyss sitting straight up in the seat as if it was one of my athletes. At first I thought it was a shadow, but as the bus moved, it stayed put, unlike the shadows around it. After about five seconds, as I pulled away from the bridge, the figure vanished. The voice on the radio had paused, but then I clearly heard it say in a static low voice, turn around. I snapped my eyes forward, terrified, and pressed the gas a little harder, praying that I could get this old bus to go faster. The bus bar and gate was open and about 50 yards away, and I only stopped when I parked the bus. I did a quick sweep of the inside to make sure that nobody had stowed away and that this was some kind of prank, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. I asked the other coaches the next day if they had ever had any weird experiences around the bridge, but they said no. I'm going to ask the coaches at the other schools as well. I did get a chance to tell this story to one of the bus drivers that I get to see most mornings during the AM drop-off. He's an older driver who's been around since 2001. He mentioned that gangs used to race down that stretch of road all the time back in the early 2000s. One day, a race ended in a fiery crash just before the bridge, and a young man lost his life. 
The bus driver had heard similar stories to mine about the radio near the bridge, but never had anybody said that they had seen an apparition before. I asked if he knew of somebody I could contact to see the footage from the camera on the bus, but he laughed and said that they would probably think I was crazy and drug test me on the spot. This was the scariest experience I have ever had driving a bus. I pass that bridge every day on the way to work and it just gives me chills. I don't have to drive a bus again for another three months, but I'm already dreading it. My cat and I were on the bus, heading up to a takeaway so I could get food for us. The nice lady sells tuna to me for my cat. And I saw multiple figures get onto the bus out of the corner of my eye. My cat even meowed at them. But when I stood up, there was no one around other than the driver. I asked the driver if anybody else had gotten on. And he just kind of shook his head and gave me this worried look. I think he had seen what I had seen, but didn't want to address it. On my walk home that night from the chippy, I saw numerous shadows in the fog, which startled my cat so much that he actually jumped off my shoulder, and I later found him at home. Usually, my cat is really well behaved, so I have no idea, but that night and that night bus were freaky. A few years back, my mom was coming home after spending the afternoon at my auntie's, cousin's, and their kid's house. When she got home, mom told my husband and I about the incident she experienced waiting for a bus. We come from a family of healers and sensitives, so I've had paranormal and supernatural experiences all my life, as has the rest of my family. My mom, Although slightly skeptical and a bit reluctant to embrace the gifts which our ancestors passed down to us, has had her fair share of unexplained events in her own life. She told us that while she was waiting for the bus, she suddenly saw movement out of the corner of her eye. Across the road, she saw three young people. In usual circumstances, this wouldn't be out of the ordinary at all as the shops are regular meeting places for all the local teenagers. However, there was something slightly odd about these young people. My mom said that they were dressed in the period of the 1970s, when my mom was a young teenager. People were milling about around them, very near them, but nobody was acknowledging them. Their existence was completely overlooked by other people, as if they were invisible. My mom was distracted for a brief moment, and when she looked back again where the mysterious teenagers had been, they were gone. She even watched the only open shop, as she thought maybe they had gone in. She waited until her bus came, 20 minutes later, but they didn't come out. There was nowhere else they could have gone in the time that my mom wasn't watching them. Mom said the most unsettling thing about it was how normal these teenagers looked, but the fact that she was the only one that seemed to be able to see them. It's a story she still tells today. I had moved into a new apartment with a roommate who was related to a friend of mine. This apartment was located on the opposite side of town, and I was not familiar with this area when I moved there. A lot of these apartments were literally newly built, but a lot of the lots around the area were still being developed, and it was a very desolate part of town. Most of the area, before construction began, 
was large amounts of old farm areas that were unkempt and no longer lived on. I am very sensitive to the paranormal, and during this time I was just beginning to understand why there was so much paranormal energy around me. My fear was literally a beacon, as my aunt explained to me. The very first event I experienced after moving into my new apartment happened within a week. At the time, I didn't have my own car, and besides getting rides from friends, I mostly had to take the bus to get to work. The bus stop that I had to walk to was pretty far away from the apartment complex. There was a lot of new construction everywhere on that road in front of the complex, but there was a gas station and a very small shopping plaza that was mostly empty, except for a bank and a small mom and pop grocery store. I used to sometimes stop at this grocery store and get some Starbucks iced coffee before walking to the bus stop. One very early morning, I want to say maybe around 5.30 a.m., I was walking to the bus stop. I had my earbuds in and I was just walking along, not really paying attention to my surroundings. Suddenly, I got a very cold chill up and down my spine and I got the distinct feeling that someone was walking behind me. I turned around, but nobody was there. I got a little nervous and left one of my earbuds out just to keep myself a little more alert. I continued walking and was almost to the shopping plaza when I heard running footsteps behind me. I turned around again, and even though I continued hearing the footsteps and was totally frozen in fear, I didn't see anything. I couldn't move a muscle. And then I heard something rustle in the bushes next to the sidewalk very close to me, and the footsteps stopped. I caught my breath, and for some reason the energy that I felt was not a positive one. So I decided to sprint to the little grocery store in the plaza. I calmed myself down long enough to walk over and buy what I needed. Then I realized I had at least another seven to eight minutes to walk to get to the bus stop. As I near the door to leave the store, in the parking lot, I see as clear as day a figure of a man that seemed like he was standing in his own fog. I honestly couldn't tell any of his features, but as soon as he seemed to realize that I saw him, he vanished before my eyes. I looked around to see if maybe anybody else had seen it, but it was 5.50 a.m. at this point, and no one was in the store with me except for the person at the register. I gathered my courage and forced myself to walk to the bus stop. As I'm waiting for the bus to arrive, I again started to feel a shiver, and my heartbeat quickened. I got up from the bench where I was waiting and began to look around, but I couldn't see anything. Then, I swear as I breathe, I heard directly in my ear the voice of a man say, I'm sorry. As I'm typing this story out, I literally have chills just remembering the sound of his voice. I instantly knew that it was the figure I had seen in the parking lot. I stood there so freaked out, almost in tears, and the bus finally came to get me. After this happened to me, I paid my friend to drive me to work for the next two months. A lot of other weird things have happened, but this tops the list. I was in the middle of nowhere and I heard a knock on my car's mirror. I work as a security guard in various hospitals and I keep on changing sites during my shift because that's what my job requires me to do. I was going to another site tonight at about 1230 in the morning when I stopped my car at a signal. The roads were pretty empty, emptier than usual, maybe due to the long weekend here in Canada. It was all dark around and not even a single person or car. Then when I stopped at the signal, my car just turned off automatically. Then I heard some kind of knock, 
as though somebody was knocking on the back mirror of my car. I looked around from the inside, but I couldn't see anybody. I checked all the mirrors in the doors, and they were all locked, and then I left. There was nobody and nothing around that could have made that noise, and I'm just wondering if anybody can explain this. Back in 2019, my girlfriend and I went on a vacation to an island in Italy. Everything went well, except that the last day it did rain a little bit. It didn't rain a lot though. The streets were dry, but the sky was gray, and we came back to our little house at about 5 p.m. because of the weather. We got bored pretty quickly, and we had to wait at least three or four hours before going to eat at a restaurant so I decided to visit the only part of the island I hadn't seen. We got on the motorbike and went to Calafante, which I found out was totally abandoned due to a collapse that had happened in 2017. The whole neighborhood was as neglected and deserted as the beach and the restaurant were, and I swear we passed through every house, road, or parking lot, and it was just deserted. Nobody lived there, not even a tourist or a car. I think that the collapse of the beach made that spot a little bit less interesting. Anyway, I kept driving in that neighborhood until I ended up at a dead-end street near a football field. But there were two kids playing football on the end of the street, and people noticed that every house nearby was shut close. Not a single sign of a human being for kilometers, so where did these two kids come from? We got close, and my girlfriend and I were already a little bit freaked out. But I wanted to talk to them, because if I remember correctly, I was looking for a place that I couldn't find, and I thought perhaps they would know where it was. We approached them. They were no more than six or seven years old, dirty as hell like just came out of a coal mine dirty. One kid had a white, more like a gray, dirty and torn t-shirt, and the other only had his rag-like pants on. Both of them were without shoes and with their hair completely shaved. The shirtless kid had a circular wound, more like a hole right in the middle of his pectorals. It was red, bloody, and new like he had just been shot in the middle of the chest. I asked them this thing and they answered me, but I couldn't understand a thing. It wasn't like the local dialect or any Italian dialect at all. It was completely incomprehensible. They kept talking and pointing at my bike. We couldn't understand a thing, so we just said goodbye and made a U-turn. I could see them staring at us from my mirrors. We were so freaked out. They looked pretty injured, but they were acting super casual. I don't know why, but my girlfriend and I are pretty sure they were some kind of ghost. Like maybe kids that died in the World War or something like that. I don't know if it's a proper paranormal encounter, but it's the only story that I still can't explain. I'm a female, and I was hanging out in the car last night at about 5 in the morning with my best friend, who's also female. I will refer to her as Heidi. We wanted to watch the sunrise, but we live in a pretty big city, so we were trying to find a flat, high place where we could see the sky. Basically, I was just driving east until I found an empty parking lot or something that would be suitable. I guess we got distracted with the conversation, because I drove probably a lot farther than I should have. Suddenly there weren't any buildings or lights around at all, just darkness and a few trees. Up ahead by a stop sign, there was this squarish gray shape that was lighter than the surrounding area. 
We both leaned forward and squinted to see what it was. Heidi asked what it was, and I said, it's where the road goes up or something like that. It was really dark, so I wasn't positive, but I was pretty sure. I think she said something else after that, but I don't really remember what it was because it was just a normal conversation. The road suddenly dipped, and I drove up the slightest incline. I'm almost to the stop sign at the end, and then it hits us at the same time. Something is wrong. This feeling slams into me. The air goes still, the car goes quiet, and without even looking, I know my friend feels it too. I've never felt anything like it. Fear, I guess, but different somehow. My ears and the back of my neck were really hot, like that feeling just before you pass out, almost like when you've stood too long with your knees locked, but I was wide awake and sitting. My heart was tight in my chest, like someone had their hand wrapped around it, and I felt sick to my stomach. Not like I was going to throw up, just really uneasy. It was like primal fear. I'm not really describing this well enough. It's kind of indescribable, but that's the gist of it. It was like my body knew something that my mind didn't, which is why the only word I really have for it is primal. This all hits me in the few seconds it takes me to get to the stop sign. When I pull up to it, I see that right in front of us is a roadblock with a big yellow sign on it. Dead end. My heart was beating so fast I couldn't even feel it. Neither of us were breathing. I'm not sure if I imagined it or not, but somehow the woods around us got even darker. Like, unnaturally dark. I got this feeling that just kept telling me I have to get us out of here right now. Turn around, my best friend says quietly. I don't look at her, but her voice is deadly serious. My head runs through the scenario impossibly fast. The road was too tight, so if I tried to turn around the way we'd come, I'd either hit a tree or I'd have to stop, reverse, stop, put it in drive over and over again. No thanks. I turned left instead, speeding out of there, and as I drove farther away, the horrible feeling gradually lessened until it was less cold-blooded fear and more deep-seated discomfort. Did you feel that? Heidi said when we finally got to a stoplight and saw a building. We started talking to each other, just basically saying, what was that? And Heidi actually said it first, but apparently in the moment we had thought the exact same thing. I'm about to see something. I remember looking around in the dark when it happened, and I was just sure that I was going to see something. I don't even know what I was expecting, but I was just positive about it. Heidi said she looked away from the windows, but I was driving, and I didn't really get up the urge to look away for some reason. I don't know. I know nothing really happened, but this really spooked me. Heidi said something like, Maybe it was an animal hiding in the woods, or maybe there was a dead body, or maybe it was just a person who had really bad intentions. I don't know, but no logical human explanation feels sinister enough. I pulled up a satellite view on my phone of where we were, and there's not really much going on in that immediate area. Past the dead end sign, the woods get thicker and the road turns into gravel and eventually leads to this non-profit organization, some kind of little church organization. There's a few little buildings built in a circle and what seems to be some mobile homes or RVs or something, and two to three houses, all in this little clearing in the middle of the woods. There's also a little river past that. Other than that, there's just not really anything around there. Still, I haven't stopped thinking about this since it happened.
This is the true story of my childhood through adult years as I recount it. Rattlesnake Road is an original name to a road that has since been changed. I used it to maintain anonymity. I was born on Long Island, New York, and ever since I can remember, I've had really strange experiences. I was never able to sleep at night, and from a young age, I was always terrified of the dark. Yes, every child is afraid of the dark, but I was afraid for a reason that I was unable to explain until later in life. There are a few stories from while I was there, but I want to fast forward to when I was a little bit older and things began to make sense to me. My family purchased a second home and we moved to Colorado. We lived on a ranch located at the top of a hill that fed into the Rocky Mountains. There wasn't much around us, a few neighbors, our barn with our animals, and thousands of acres of hilly and mountainous terrain that surrounded our family. There was a long dirt road that led to our property, Rattlesnake Road. It was a perfect shot of the scenery leading up to our small three-bedroom home. It was quiet, peaceful, but the land was old. I was about seven years old at the time. This is when I began to understand what I was going through wasn't normal. Our home was small. It was a ranch-style house with a three-car garage, which took up half of the structure. The other half was built into the hillside, where you entered from the front. You walked into the living room and you could see straight out the back sliding doors into the plains. In front of you was the kitchen, old with brick. Straight down the hallway, my room was on the right, my brother's room followed that, and lastly my parents' room was on the left. The bathrooms connected and were on the right as well, wrapping around to the back of the house. I left the hallway lights on when I slept. I was scared to begin with, but something always felt as though it wasn't just our family there. One night, I was up and I couldn't fall back asleep. My parents and brother were sleeping as well. I could hear them snoring down the hall. My bedroom door was open and I was facing the hallway when suddenly the pull string to my closet made a click and the lights popped on. I could see the light making its way through the slatted shades of my closet accordion doors and my heart began to race. Then they shut off. The air in the room became cold, tense, almost as though the oxygen was being siphoned out. The silence set in. I couldn't hear the snoring anymore. I couldn't hear anything. I looked toward the hallway, and there was a short, black static mist. It had no facial features, but what I could see would have been a mouth. It seemed as though it was smiling ear to ear, which paralyzed me with an intense feeling of dread. It passed out my doorway and out of sight, not making a sound. Moments later, I heard what sounded like the door to our garage open and close, and the air lifted. All of my surroundings returned to normal. I knew I was awake. I knew what I had seen there, and it visited me only to get worse as time went on. That image will be burned into my mind for the rest of my life. I have had many paranormal, seemingly extraterrestrial, glitch in the matrix and skinwalker experiences. I think one too many for one person to have. The one I am going to tell you about freaks me out to this day. There is quite a bit of detail to this story, so I will try to make it as coherent as possible. The time was 2011, my final year of high school. Now, I am a Navajo from a small reservation in New Mexico, and the nearest city is 30 miles west. I attended a public school in that city. Therefore, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to catch the bus at 6. 
which picked up more kids along the way. And we would arrive with just enough time to get breakfast before class at 7.25. This particular morning seemed normal. My alarm went off at 5. I showered, fixed my hair, and was ready by 5.40. I would usually give myself 10 to 15 minutes to make some breakfast and pack my lunch. I did just that and decided to have Pop-Tarts that morning. I checked the time on the stove clock and it was 5.50. I popped the tarts into the toaster and went to my room to gather my things into my backpack. As I was finished with that, I saw that my alarm clock read 5.55 and I went to grab my Pop-Tarts. The stove clock read 5.56. We had a big clock right by our front door, and it also read 5.56. I checked the time often so that I could perfectly time my walk to the bus so that it showed up just as I arrived at my bus stop. Additionally, it was a winter morning and it was dark out. The sun didn't start to come up until about seven, and I didn't want to be stuck in the cold dark for too long. Normally, when I stepped outside, there would be cars driving about, neighbors who turned on their vehicles to warm them up from a frigid winter night. But that morning, there was nobody, and that was a bit strange to me, but I didn't pay that fact any mind. Now, since it's the reservation, aka the middle of nowhere, where I lived, there wasn't much light either. Few residents had streetlights in the cluster of homes where I lived. Unfortunately, the route that I walked every day had no streetlights, so the only lights I could see in the near pitch black were the ones at my back from our porch light in the north, a neighbor's porch light who lived three acres away in the southern direction, and the far-off lights of the city that lit the sky in the east. There were also the lights from the reservation clinic, which was about a mile south as well. I should also let you know that each home in a cluster of homes is set on an acre lot. My bus stop was two acres away. I would walk directly south to meet up with the only paved road, the highway, which met the dirt road in the east. From my home to that stop, it only took me a minute or two. When I stepped outside, nothing was astir, which, like I said, was really odd. However, I wasn't out there alone because although it was almost pitch black, I saw the silhouette of a girl who caught the bus at the same time as I did and at the same stop. Good, I thought, I'm not out here alone. I followed about 10 feet behind her. When we neared the stop, she veered off to the cattle guard where she always sat to wait for the bus. I always sat on the porch steps of my uncle's house when the bus hadn't arrived yet which was only about five to 10 yards from the bus stop. When I sat on those steps, I started to notice more and more things that were out of place. One of those was the fact that my uncle, an early riser who was always awake by five, who always had his lights on by the time I was catching the bus, was not awake. He wasn't out having his morning coffee as usual. No lights, no sounds from inside his house. I thought, well, maybe he's sleeping in today. Then the neighbor whose home was three acres away from mine, my uncle's next door neighbor, whose porch light was on, would normally have had their vehicle running, warming up by now, and their lights would be on showing that somebody was awake and probably getting ready for work. But there were no signs of anybody being awake at all, and the truck wasn't on. Well, maybe they have the day off, I thought still waiting for the bus. The other girl's silhouette I could see from the city lights that lit the sky to the east, and she was still sitting there and waiting as well. I was a little bit unsettled, but I didn't start to feel really creeped out until I started to hear the howls and yelps from what sounded to be a pack of coyotes that seemed to be only across the main highway. Since I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I had guessed that I was waiting for about 10 minutes. Finally, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Where is the bus? It should have been here by now. I was on time and it was very unlike the bus or the bus driver to pick us up more than five minutes late. 
I decided to wake up my uncle and ask if maybe we had missed the bus. So I knocked on his door for a good three minutes to no avail. Then I just decided to walk over and ask the girl if she wanted to walk back to our homes together, since I was sufficiently weirded out by the events. As I neared her and where she sat, my eyesight adjusted in the darkness, and when I was within arm's reach, I saw that there was nobody there. I thought I was going crazy. My mind raced and I felt panic and queasy in the pit of my stomach. All the creepy skinwalker and paranormal stories that I had heard over the years began to run amok in my mind. But what remains from those stories was that I was always told to never fear any of it. You should never be afraid of the evil things that lurk in the darkness, because your fear is their fuel. I decided not to panic and run home. Instead, I just walked briskly back home, still able to hear the whoops and calls from the nearby pack of coyotes and trying to figure out what was going on. When I got inside, I went to my mom's room and asked to use her cell phone. Just as she was about to hand me her cell, she took a second glance at the screen and said, It's four in the morning. What do you need my phone for? Shock took hold of my body, and all I could do was stand there with my mouth wide open as she trailed her remark with, Are you awake? Have you been sleepwalking? I have never sleptwalked in my entire life and my reply felt forced, like I had to convince her that I was awake. I ran back to the kitchen. The clock read 4 a.m. The clock by the front door read 4 a.m. And the alarm clock in my room read 4 a.m. I don't know anything about any of these types of sleep disorders, but I seriously think that there's no way for me to have gone through with my usual routine the way that I did asleep. Needless to say, I was sufficiently freaked out and crawled back into bed. So freaked out I didn't even take my shoes off. I fell asleep thinking of the whole situation, and ironically I missed the bus that day. I told my third oldest sister, there are four of us and I'm the youngest, about what had happened. She was a little shocked at what she was hearing, and then she began to tell me of a dream she had before my experience. Now, her dreams we have begun to revere as visions of sorts, since she's had many of them end up coming true. Her earliest one, I remember, was when we were in elementary school, and my dad called and said that earlier in the day he was in a small airplane, and that they nearly crashed into the mountains near San Carlos, Arizona. She told us about a dream about being in an airplane, in a heavily forested area that the plane was about to crash, but was able to land safely a few days before we got that call from our dad. Since then, she's had others, some she tells us about, others she doesn't. Before I tell you about the dream, I must also tell you about a weird incident that happened to said sister at my eldest sister's house. This particular incident happened the summer preceding the winter. I had a weird experience. My sister, the dream visionary, would stay over at my eldest sister's house to help babysit my nephews. They would stay up very late, and one night or morning, because it was around 2 a.m., they heard a sort of banging in the back of the house. My sister and the nephew went out to check. When they opened the door, they saw two horses, one white and one brown, kicking with their hooves and hitting their heads against the big garbage bins which were knocking into the house. It was as if they were trying to get in, but for what, we had no clue. To add to that weirdness, my sister's house is in a housing development that has two entrances, and since it's on the reservation, those entrances have cattle guards. So how could those two horses have gotten in? Anyway, they chased the horses out of the yard and they galloped off to who knows where. Anyway, back to her dream. She said that she was asleep at my eldest sister's house and woke up to the same banging noise that those horses had been making that night in the summer. She said she got up and walked to the front window and looked out past the blinds and saw those same horses standing just inches from her on the other side of the window. Then she saw the two horses shape shift into people 
an in-law and his son. They had menacing looks on their faces, and she said she felt that they were pure evil. She yelled at them to go away, and as soon as she turned away, she saw me, sleepwalking toward the back door. She went to grab me to put me back in bed, but as she got closer, she saw that the back door was wide open and that the sun was beckoning me to follow him, to go outside. As I took a few steps out the door, she pulled me back inside, slammed and locked the door, and laid me back down, and that was where her dream ended. The story, however, gets creepier. After that weird time warp occurrence coupled with my sister's dream, my mom decided to take me to see a medicine man to have a prayer ceremony. He said that it was a skinwalker who was messing with our family. He said that the skinwalker intended to destroy my mom's life, but that she was too strong, and that the harm it wished for her would then fall to her children, the weaker ones. And here I thought I was being pretty strong. Further, he said that the skinwalker impersonated the shadow of the girl who usually rode the bus with me and was also the one who created the sounds of the coyotes. The skinwalker created an illusion to lure me outside and that the skinwalker was someone within the family. After the prayer ceremony, he said that I should never repeat anything that he said or even the events that occurred. I don't think a lot of people heed that though. I don't know if he would call it a warning or advice from the medicine man, but a lot of Navajos, if you get close enough to them, and they're not super traditional, will tell you all about scary and weird skinwalker stories of their own. They're pretty common, and even the ones that caused them to have to get a prayer or ceremony done, they'll tell those too. And this story is mine. About five years ago, when I was 14, my best friend and I, both female, went for a walk on a hiking route in our village. We had always known that it existed, but we'd never gone there, so we didn't know how long the hike would take. About halfway through, it started to get really dark outside. The route was a road through the woods that had no street lights whatsoever. So we called one of our guy friends that had a crosser bike to come so that we wouldn't be alone. He came and we continued our walk in complete darkness. He turned off the bike because it was loud and decided to just push it. We didn't use our flashlights because the moonlight illuminated our path. As we were walking and talking, I heard something about 20 feet away in the woods that sounded like a loud scream through crying. I immediately stopped and looked at my friends, because I thought I was the only one who had heard it. But their terrified looks told me that they had heard it too. The two of them jumped on the bike and I ran after them to the first streetlight. Yeah, I know, they left me behind. We were panicking and trying to find an explanation for that sound. Maybe some kind of animal? Until I remembered a story about the Drekovac. I live in Balkan, and I don't think the name has a translation, but I guess I would call it maybe a howler or a screamer. Basically, it's a mythology creature characteristic in the Balkans, and there are probably 20 different beliefs as to what it is. This is the only paranormal thing that has ever happened to me, and to this day I get goosebumps when I tell the story to somebody because I remember it like it happened yesterday. When I was 17, my 13-year-old sister died. I was moved out and living in Michigan at the time, and she was living with our mother in Texas. She and a friend that was staying the night with her snuck out to meet her friend's boyfriend, and at 1.50 a.m. in the middle of downtown, she was struck by an oncoming train and died. A little side note that I find strange 
is that that night, I had the feeling that something was coming. I was too afraid to sleep. I left the light on all night, and I pushed my mattress far to one side, so that I could line the bed frame with my crystals, and hopefully protect myself from whatever was coming. I messaged a few of my friends, even, telling them to stay safe. It never crossed my mind that my younger sister was in danger. At 5 a.m., I'm up watching TV with my roommate, and my mom calls. She asks if I'm sitting down. I run into my room and sit, and I ask her what's up. She tells me that Nan is dead and explains what happened. I swear my soul left my body for a moment. I heard my own screams like I was underwater. I barely remember the rest of the day, but I was able to go pack and I was on my way to Texas in a plane very early the next morning. I listened to How It's Going to Be on repeat for the whole ride. When I finally made it to my mom's, I bypassed everybody and went into my sister's room and sat on her bed, soaking up the last of her scent. The week was a blur. I held my mother, wrote the obituary. My older sisters and I planned her memorial. I wove together a crown of flowers from our yard for her to wear while she was cremated. I don't think any of us ate a single morsel of food, despite loving community members pummeling us with casseroles. Exactly seven days after her death, nearly to the minute, my older sisters and I were hiding behind the garage sharing a smoke. There was a light directly above us, illuminating the space we were in, and shrouding the rest of the farm in an even blacker darkness. Suddenly I hear, Josie's on a vacation far away, come around and talk it over. So many things that I want to say. You know I like my girls a little bit older. Quietly at first, we all joined in for the chorus, confirming that they heard this song as well, and the next verse was louder. We joined in for the chorus again, and she's louder still, surrounding us. It sounded like she was singing from the darkness, directly next to the garage, and inching closer with every word. She sings the entire song, and then suddenly my sisters take off running and I follow. It's strange, I was scared. I mean, I was sure it was my sister, and yet I felt fearful. We all run inside and stand in the dimly lit living room, talking over what just happened. Two of my sisters swear that it was my mother singing, on top of our old windmill, so the sound was traveling. My other sister and I swear it was Nan. One of my sisters creeps upstairs to check on my mother, and she's fast asleep. At this point, we all run outside, shrieking Nan's name into the dark, trying to get her to come back. She doesn't. We googled the song lyrics and they were just absolutely perfect for expressing what she was trying to. She sang the whole thing, loud and clear. It still rocks me whenever I think about it. Absolutely crazy and unbelievable. This happened in 2009, during my summer holiday when I was eight years old. As we had done for many years, my family and I went to Cordoba, Argentina, and rented a cabin. Strange things often happened at that cabin, like objects moving around, strange noises, or even items that just disappeared. One night, I was sleeping when I suddenly got up in the middle of the night I looked in front of me, and there was an old, creepy woman who was just staring at me. She didn't say a word, so I just closed my eyes, and when I opened them, she was gone. I ran to my father's bedroom and told my parents, but of course they didn't believe me. About two years ago, we went to those cabins again. One day, I struck up a conversation with the owner, and he was telling me about some strange noises he had heard that night. Surprised, I told him about the creepy vision that I had had. He just answered, You are not the first one that that has happened to. Many people have reported having visions of an old woman or a girl who stares at them in the night.
I've always had an open mind when it comes to spirits, ghosts, specters, whatever you want to call them. I'd never personally experienced anything until the night that I'm about to describe. A little background. I was about 23 years old, and I had been in the U.S. Air Force for about five years. I had moved from Texas, where I was raised, to Alaska. I had been deployed a couple of times and had been halfway around the world at least twice. While traveling, I had seen the dance clubs in the Philippines and seen the party scene in the areas just off base in South Korea. I was married to my first wife, and we had since moved to a base called K.I. Sawyer Air Force Base in Michigan, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan to be exact, about three and a half hours northeast of Green Bay, Wisconsin. For some reason or another, the first wife and I had several of our friends come over and we were having some kind of movie or game night. In our base house living room, we had two TVs running. One had a movie, another had a game system, and we were all just playing some games and having fun. We were one seat short for the number of folks we had over, and we would take turns standing as somebody would get up for some reason or another. Move your meat, lose your seat rule was in full effect. I was sitting in the middle seat of our couch, and a friend, Fox, was standing near some windows behind me to the right. I thought I heard somebody whisper my name from the kitchen area that was behind me to the left. I craned my neck over to see if there was someone in there that I wasn't aware of, but nope. I figured I was just imagining things and I got up to check the kitchen and head to the bathroom. The bathroom was right near there. When I came out, Fox had taken my seat, so I started standing where he had been. From where I was, I could see our whole living room and kitchen area, just watching the movie and people gaming. Then I heard it again. Somebody whispered my name, but louder. Fox craned his head around to look into the kitchen, just as I spun my head over to look in there. Fox, did you hear that too? Yeah, he said. Someone said your name. From where I was, I could see everybody that was in my house at once and nobody was in the kitchen. Fox could see everybody except me. I trotted into the kitchen and turned on the light, and that's when I saw a shape outside of the kitchen window on the little porch where the door was. The best way to describe what I saw next is this shape was something that looked like The Undertaker from WWE. Big, broad-brimmed hat and all dark colors. The shape turned and stepped down the steps, and turned out of the little bit of light that was coming from my window. I was a young buck, and I was thinking, ain't no way someone's gonna peek into my windows, so I beat feet to the door and out into the night. But there was no one. When I came out of the door, I had a clear view for about 75 to 100 feet in all directions, and there was nothing moving out there. Most of my neighbors had dogs, and none of them were barking. It was silent. No barking dogs, no insects, no engines, nothing. A couple of my friends had joined me outside and none of us saw or heard anything. Now I've been six feet tall since I was 18 years old and I went back in and had my ex-wife hold her finger where the shoulder of the shape was. I went outside and the shoulder of this thing was around four inches higher than my shoulder. So this thing was at least six four. No one in the house other than Fox heard my name called, and nobody saw the shape except me. The fact that Fox did hear my name is the only reason I don't think I imagined it. That was the night that I became a true believer in the supernatural. So this is a true story that happened to me, which I'm weary to share, as there have been many times where I've opened up only to be met with ridicule. But I hope you take this seriously, because I do. Back in 2008, my girlfriend and I decided to go to an abandoned mental asylum off of Highway 82 in Alabama called Old Bryce. It shut down a few years back due to malpractice, and some of the ghost legends 
like the number two ghost, involve murder by staff at the facility. Essentially, this was a dumping ground for people that society didn't know what to do with. Thousands of people were sent there, and died there. The facility consisted of four buildings. Bryce, the residence hall, S.D. Allen, the medical facility, the crematorium, and the guard shack. I have seen two ghosts in the residence hall. The bigger of the two, I'll share with you now. My second visit to old Bryce was strange. It was my first time inside the building, and I came prepared. It was me, my girlfriend, and our friend Chris. I had a flashlight and a DVD camcorder. Through the main entrance is a staircase on the right, which zigzags up to the second floor, complete with an anti-side fence at the top. Make a left, then another left, and then a quick right, and you're in the hall that led to the children's corridor. I had the flashlight in my left hand, and my camera in the right, scanning, trying to catch something. On the left at the entrance to that room, there was a bathroom with only a tub in it. I thought I saw something in the bathroom, and shined the light that way. Nothing. I moved the camera and light, thought I saw it again, and shined it back. Nothing. Our night continued and finished without incident. The next day, I reviewed the footage. In that bathroom, I shined towards something I thought I saw, and I was right. When the light pans to the right, a bluish-white, illuminated little girl's face peers out from behind the door to follow the light. As the light shines back in her direction over the course of just two frames, she's behind the door halfway, and in the next frame, she's gone. My heart felt like ice water had run through it. I was in such shock. I proceeded to show everybody I knew. The girl's appearance was that of a younger one, maybe 10, hair parted in the middle, an unusually large forehead, and was deformed in some way. I made the mistake of leaving the camera at a friend's house overnight, who apparently was not my friend because he stole it. This is where it gets even weirder, though. Two and a half years later, I was living in a different city. One of the legends of old Bryce is that windows grow back, and if you do any damage to them, spirits will follow you home. I broke a window on accident. I was laying in bed one night at about 3 to 4 a.m. I was on the verge of sleep, aware of where I was, and very comfortable. Out of nowhere, this immobilizing, tingling sensation started at the tips of my toes. I was laying on my stomach with my arms under the pillow, completely helpless, as this sensation crept its way slowly up my legs, midsection, and eventually my entire body over the course of maybe 20 seconds. Once it covered me, I heard the whisper of a little girl directly in my ear say, I'm in your room. I cringed tightly, and for some reason I said out loud, I love you. The feeling stopped, and the whole incident left me on the verge of tears. It may or may not have been that little girl from the asylum, but according to legend, it makes sense. In order to really convey how scared I was when this happened, I'm gonna have to back up and give you a little context. For starters, I've told the whole story to maybe a handful of my closest friends, and the only family I've ever told is my twin sister. Even then, it only came up because they initiated conversations about similar topics regarding the paranormal. If I can help it, I'd rather not talk about it in real life. But here, on the wilds of the internet though, I guess I feel a little bit safer. It's also worth noting that I've included several instances that may or may not be related. Whether or not they truly are is a matter of personal speculation, but they are all paranormal nonetheless. If I had to pinpoint where it all began, I would say it was 2008, when I stayed home alone pretty much all summer. 
My sisters attended the Boys and Girls Club, and my parents worked all day. I was just a 13-year-old boy then, so staying home alone was pretty much the greatest thing I could think of. All I had on the agenda every day was eating junk food, playing video games, and doing whatever small chores I was assigned. Not a bad way to spend a summer. And it wasn't. For a few weeks, anyhow. When things started, though, they started small. Every couple of days, my mom would come home pissed off when she saw both of our dogs outside. We lived in North Alabama, so summer was hot and swampy. Because of that, we tended to keep the dogs inside until they needed to be let out to do their business, but it would never be any more than about 10 minutes. I loved those dogs, so I adhered to the 10-minute rule very strictly. It was also why I was so confused to see them outside on those days. I definitely did not let them out. Sure, I can be forgetful sometimes. Maybe one or two of those times I really did just have a brain fart. But I was 100% sure that most of those times I never let those dogs out. When I told that to my mom, she looked kind of concerned. Then I started hearing things. With freshly installed hardwood floors, I was familiar with the sound of them settling when the AC kicked on. It would be one or two popping sounds, then it would stop, until the AC turned off again. Rinse and repeat. Nothing crazy about that. One day, while I was binge playing old Nintendo games, I heard the board settling again. But this time, it wasn't because of the AC. And instead of one or two pops, there were several dozen, moving around. They went up and down the hallway, like somebody was pacing around. I paused my game and I listened to them. Thinking maybe my mom or my stepdad were back early from work, I went out to see them, and make sure the dogs were back inside so I wouldn't get chewed out again. But nobody was home. I shrugged it off as the floorboards just being particularly active that day and I went back to playing my game once more. About an hour passed before the sounds repeated, the same quiet little footsteps. I paused my game again, and I listened harder this time. Another sound surfaced on top of the steps. It was kind of like trying to hear somebody else's phone call from across the room. You know there's a conversation going on, but you can't quite make out what it's about. I went to look again, this time going all the way across the house and into my parents' room. Still nobody. Then I thought, well, maybe the conversation was coming from outside in the neighborhood. I brought the dogs out back with me, and they went and did their business while I waited on the porch. From what I could tell, it was just another stiff, silent summer day. This particular thing happened a few more times, and it always made me feel really uneasy. It was even worse when I told my mom about it. She replied, Oh good, you hear it too. Then she went on to tell me not to tell my stepdad, because he was very religious and for some reason didn't believe in any of this stuff. Things settled down after summer was over and they stayed that way for a while. I had school to keep me occupied, and other than a few small instances, we had two quiet years. 2010 was the year things picked up a lot more. While my twin and my girlfriend at the time were hanging out in her room, they started messing around taking dumb pictures with digital cameras. Now, my twin's room was the coldest in the house, and nobody could ever figure out why. It also used to belong to my older sister. Both times either of them moved into the room, their demeanor would change over the course of a few months. Where my older sister became more manic, throwing tantrums with growing frequency, my twin was starting to get depressed, sleeping all the time and always being fairly disconnected. While all three women in the house suffered from manic depression, bipolar disorder, and sometimes both, there was a very noticeable difference when my sisters occupied the room. And that digital camera my twin was playing around with? There was a picture on it that we didn't find for weeks after the fact that showed my girlfriend at the time and a really weird, smoky, veil-like presence in the room with them. Neither of them smoked, and the room never smelled like anything, so we weren't allowed to have candles in our room either. 
I'm still kicking myself for not saving that photo somewhere, because I think it might have been a good piece of evidence. On top of the apparition caught on my camera, my mother told me of an instance where footsteps walked from the kitchen and into the study where she worked on some stuff for her job. When the steps entered the room, she heard a voice whisper, ouch, very clearly into her ear. The next few experiences were things only I witnessed. They are, by and large, the more extreme parts of what I now guess to be a haunting, and they started in the summer of the same year, with my first episode of sleep paralysis. I had known about the phenomenon before it happened to me. My mom was a sufferer of frequent night terrors and the occasional paralysis. I also had a friend with narcolepsy that told me about it at school. The first time it happened to me, I wasn't too unsettled. It was on a weekend, and I drifted off watching Netflix. The next thing I knew, I was wide awake, and a few episodes of the show had gone by. I reached for a bottle of water by my bed, but I found that I couldn't move at all. It was strange, and almost calm. I just kind of accepted what was happening, and I let it run its course. It eventually did. I got up, had a drink of water, went to the bathroom, and then went back to bed. A few days after the paralysis, things started moving around on their own. Another day spent home alone, I was once again playing video games and avoiding any responsibilities. As I had tried giving up soda that year, I almost always had a cup on my desk, filled either with orange juice or empty. There was rarely an in-between. This cup, however, just fell over in front of my eyes. There was no slant on the desk or anything like that. Nothing other than the cup was on it. It just tipped over, like someone had smacked it over. While I thought it was odd, I set it back upright and went on with my gaming. I had settled that it was some kind of trick of gravity, which in hindsight sounds way more ridiculous than a poltergeist. This was immediately followed by the sound of a bird hitting my window, my light bulb exploding overhead, and the cup once again tipping over. Unable to rationalize it this time, I scrambled out of my room and into the kitchen, where my stepdad was eating. As I said earlier, my mom asked me not to talk to him about anything paranormal, but I was pretty shook up by what I had just seen. He asked me if I was alright. I told him that a bird had flown into my window and kind of scared the crap out of me, to which he laughed. I didn't sleep very well that night. The last and most extreme incident I had at that house happened just about a week later, my second episode of a sleep paralysis. It was a Sunday morning and I could hear my family moving about the house to get ready. It didn't take me long to prepare myself, so I tended to sleep in an extra 15 minutes. As I fell back to sleep, a familiar feeling came over me. Unable to speak, I couldn't call for help. A weight on my chest made it difficult to breathe. I was incapable of moving. Thinking it would pass like last time, I just waited. It became evident very quickly that this was not going to be like last time. What little daylight there was coming in through the curtains turned blood red. Instead of the calm I had during the first episode, I grew very unsettled. It was dark now, and the room looked like one of those photo development rooms in terms of color. My door opened on its own. A figure stood there, just looked like a silhouette, all dark and shrouded. It wore what appeared to be a robe made of thick fur, and kept its hood drawn over. Even though my room was normally comfortable, I felt the temperature drop. I could see my own breath and the breath of this figure. It just kept staring at me. Something about it felt evil, like it was waiting to do something awful to me. I tried to yell and make it go away. I even attempted to invoke the name of Christ, but I couldn't speak or breathe enough to do so. The blood red changed to pitch black. The figure disappeared into it, but a pair of dark red eyes pierced through me from where it stood. I then saw two numbers sort of fly at me. 13 and 3. That's when the paralysis ended, I got up, and I went to church. I've since lost my faith and I'm no longer religious. 
Just what I saw that morning is still a mystery to me. But I did follow up on those two numbers that same morning in church. Psalm chapter 13, verse 3, reads in the King James Version, quote, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Needless to say, I got chills, and I still do every time I tell the story. This happened probably about two years ago, except my memory of when it happened is really hazy and I struggle to place it on my timeline. I would say I was about 15 years old and it was the middle of the night. I live in a two-story house and the second story is quite high, so I sleep with the curtains wide open as I like to look at the stars. For reference, the window that's in this room takes up almost the whole wall. I woke up one night and my room was completely bright. My bed is in the corner opposite the window and all I could see out in my window was a blinding light taking up the entire window. My bedroom was completely lit up and I could barely look out the window because it was like looking into the sun. I sat there for probably about two minutes absolutely paralyzed with fear before I decided to grab my phone and film it. The second I grabbed my phone, the light went out and my room went back to dark. I couldn't make out anything through the window as my eyes had to adjust since it had been so bright. And once I could see, after about maybe a minute, there was nothing out of the ordinary. I wrote myself a note to look at in the morning because I needed evidence that it hadn't been a dream. I eventually got back into bed and tried to sleep, but the adrenaline and fear kept me up for hours. I managed to fall asleep eventually, and when I woke up, the note was exactly where I left it. I spoke to my family, but they were all adamant that they hadn't seen or heard anything. I have explored every logical possibility including sleep paralysis and night terrors, and even the possibility that I was hallucinating. But I've never hallucinated before, and I haven't since. I have no history of mental illness other than depression, which I wasn't struggling with at the time. And the same with night terrors and sleep paralysis. The note I left myself has proved to me that I wasn't asleep when it happened. This was during a time when I had some weird experiences happening while I was asleep. I would wake up with strange bruises and scratches all over my body almost every day. My memories from around that time are very hazy, and I can only remember bits and pieces. That time of my life is almost blurry to me, and I usually have an excellent memory. Any possible explanations? Six years ago, my boyfriend at the time, husband now, woke me up sweating and shaking in absolute fear. I asked him what was wrong and he began stuttering and telling me that I would never believe him. He went on to tell me that he was woken up around midnight to this person standing at the end of the bed. Yes, my first thought was sleep paralysis as well, but he sat up and was ready to attack if he needed to. In his head, he heard a voice that wasn't him, telling him that it was okay and that they weren't there for any bad reasons. He said he felt immediately calm from that. He also noted that he was shocked with what a light sleeper I was and that his movements hadn't woken me. This being was unnaturally tall and had to crouch a little due to its height and us having been asleep in the basement. He said that this being reached out for a greeting and again began hearing a voice in his head saying, Hello. Nothing much else happened that night as my husband was frightened. All he remembered at the time was that the last thing he heard from it in his mind was, I'll see you again soon. 
And then he said it felt as if time had started again, not realizing that it ever felt like it stopped until that point. And then he was back in reality, and that's when he woke me. What he thought had only been about a 10 to 15 minute encounter had actually taken over an hour. These visits continued for months, minimum once a week, max three to four times, but my husband got less and less frightened every time. This thing and him built a sort of friendship from what he explained to me. It had a name, but for the life of me, I can't remember what he said it was. It answered any and every question my husband had. I won't go into what those were here, but after a while, it just stopped. He stopped waking me up in the middle of the night or telling me about it the next morning. But the times were always the same. He would be awoken around midnight and they would have discussions about literally anything my husband was curious about. And then he would come back to reality and time would unfreeze again between 1 a.m. and 1.30 a.m., having only felt like the encounter had lasted a short period of time. Once it stopped, though, I can't emphasize enough just how much it stopped. I mean, full stop. It was like for him, it never happened. It's been six years, so I know this is choppy, but it's hard to remember everything with it having been so long ago now. I forgot about it for so long, and I don't know what prompted me to remember it just about a week ago. But now I just can't stop thinking about it and the oddness of it all, and how it just stopped so suddenly. He's literally never made mention of it ever again, and I've never brought it up to him this last week in fear that he may think I'm crazy, which I don't know why that's my fear, but part of me thinks if there's a chance he's completely forgotten it, whether it be on his own or something else, he may think I've gone insane. Anyway, if you have any ideas or similar stories, please let me know. I'm trying to figure this all out and what happened to my husband, as it's literally keeping me up at night. I'm a lucid dreamer, and I can control my dreams and my nightmares. But last night, I had a dream that was very different from anything else. I was working on the floor of my factory job and running the forklift, like normal, until out the bay door there were fireworks. It's more like a plume of light and an explosion coming from the other side of the valley. I live in the desert. We don't have valleys where I'm at. We decided to go outside after seeing these lights fly away into the sky to the left of us. Once we get outside of the bay door, the ground is illuminated like a full moon times ten. We were now in the backyard of my childhood house. We look up to the sky trying to find the light source, but it was just a night sky. When we looked to the right, there was a typical looking alien and when it noticed us, it screeched and jumped up toward us but it dissolved into the brightening light. I woke up in a scream and I couldn't sleep until daylight. My cat, who's pretty aware as well, stared at the wall behind me for a good 30 minutes. Now I can dream about scary stuff and when it happens, I can usually alter it. I can always control what I'm dreaming about, but this was different and I haven't dreamed about aliens in over 10 years. What is this supposed to mean? Have they decided to come back? Why me? My first ever encounter was when I was around seven and my family was all around the table. I will never forget the order we sat in nor what happened. My mother sat in front of me while my sister was beside me. Father was next to mom and my back was turned to the kitchen. My brother sat next to my mom in front of my sister, a family of five. We were eating and then the window straight across from my dad at the right of my direction 
shone with a very bright light. Everyone seemed frozen, but my mom and I. My mom told me to run, run and hide. My mind was blanked out and I didn't think at all. I just got up and ran to my mother's room where I felt my mind was telling me would be the safest place. Once I entered my mom's room, I went straight to her king size bed with a huge light underneath. There was nothing under my mom's bed because she kept everything in bins at the foot of her bed and closet. The foot of my mother's bed was facing the door while the head was against a wall next to two big windows. Then it was her closet across from where you were laying so you could see it. Then the bathroom was right next to that. Once I got under the bed, I saw that the light was still on. I looked through the cracks and it was quiet. And then I saw about six sets of feet that were not human. Then I felt them start to surround me. One almost touched me by getting on the bed and reaching down through the crack. There were two through the crack, three in front, not showing their faces, but trying to reach further under. One was at the foot of the bed. Then I looked near me and saw a face that was gray and had huge eyes. I felt like I couldn't move, but when I looked closer, I saw a whole galaxy in its eyes. It was so pretty how the colors merged like a sunset, and for a second I almost forgot it was an eye. Then it moved or flinched and I came to my senses. I looked around and they were still moving to get me, while the one that I looked at was staying still and looking at the closet. Then I heard the closet door opened and I saw Nega. Nega was my childhood imaginary friend that taught me the greater lessons than what is now being slowly forgotten. After seeing her, I relaxed and I saw them try to fight. And then the tall, gray-like humanoids were gone. I looked at Nega and then I looked at the bathroom to see another creature that had orange eyes that I know commonly stays in my mother's bathroom. Nega hushed me and then I seemed to have forgotten what had happened until I turned 14. After this, I just carried on with life. I never saw my imaginary friend again, but old friend still lingers from time to time in my memories. I will never forget this Wednesday night as long as I live. It was the summer before seventh grade, sometime in July. It was Wednesday night, early Thursday morning. The evening before, my family had watched the old school show, Unsolved Mysteries. I awoke in the night, lying on my right side, awake, but my eyes still shut, completely silent. None of us ran fans back then to aid in sleep. I was awake and basically waiting to fall back asleep again. However, I decided to open my eyes. On the right side of my bed, right there, was a being, seemingly fixated on a plush bear that I kept in bed with me. And this being fit all of the descriptions that I've always heard or watched on television of an alien. Shorter, pale gray skin, and those awful eyes, huge, black, and slanted, staring at my bear right by my bed. Honestly, I cannot put into words how I felt right at that moment. I was only just about 12. At some point, I pulled my covers over my head and felt an awful rushing through my body of super warm, then cool, then warm again. Only later in my life did I understand that I was most likely feeling shock. I couldn't scream. I felt frozen, too scared to scream maybe. What if I did scream? My mother and stepfather and two brothers would hear me. What the heck would they do if they came running into my room and saw this thing? What would it do? Is it going to kill me? Abduct me? What if it already had and it was returning me? All of these thoughts plus a million more just raced through my young mind. It's awful just recounting it all. 
Again, how could I ever forget something traumatic like this? So, being such a brave 11-year-old, and after what felt like 12 hours, I decided to try and scare it. I decided that I would thrash my legs up and down from under my covers as hard as I could. I know, horrifying, right? I was so petrified, though. So, I did this, and then remained under my covers, just waiting. Nothing happened. So I stayed under the covers. This had to be at least close to going on two hours from when I first opened my eyes and saw this thing. As I lay wide awake, I heard a noise. To this day, I still can't explain exactly how it sounded. The sound felt as if it surrounded me and was coming from outside. It was crisp, clean sounding, maybe mechanical, but maybe not lasting only about two seconds. A sound that I had definitely never heard before and have never heard since. As soon as I heard the sound, something in my mind told me, oh, they're gone. As crazy as it sounds, I firmly believed that the sound was their transportation leaving. Needless to say, I didn't sleep the rest of the night or early morning. It took me so long to confide in my family about this terribly scary incident. Of course, they did not believe me. However, now, from time to time, my mother will mention it and suggest that maybe that's why I suffer from insomnia now. Very well could be. This is the first time that I've shared this story publicly though, and it would be reassuring to hear any other stories of similar happenings. In my life, I've had three UFO experiences. For context, I am a 40-year-old male living in the southeastern United States. I will focus on the second one, since it's the most unquestionable event of the three. In 2015, I was living in Lexington, South Carolina, which is right outside of Columbia, the state capital. On October 5th of that year, we experienced a thousand-year flood that shut everything down and caused major damage throughout the Lexington, Columbia area. My job requires me to be at work at 3.30 or 4 in the morning, same job I have now as I had then. My job was shut down on account of the flood, but my great and wonderful company decided that I needed to be there the next day to assess the damage, despite the fact that I would have to drive through a flood. Anyway, I woke up at two, went downstairs, made some coffee, and per my usual morning routine, I stepped outside onto the back porch to have the coffee and enjoy the stillness of the twilight hours in solitude. It was lightly raining, not enough to mind it, and the sky was totally overcast with low clouds. That's important. We were in the suburbs about two blocks off of one of the main drags through town, Sunset Boulevard, 378. We weren't in the sticks, but we weren't metropolitan either. The sky was a slight orange from the streetlights reflecting off of the cloudy sky. Our house was at the end of a cul-de-sac. There were tall, lined trees lining the back and sides of the property. So I'm drinking my coffee, leaning on the banister of the deck, and in front of me in the sky, I can see something moving in my direction. My first thought was, oh, it's an owl or some kind of large bird, judging by the shape. But slowly, as the shape got bigger and bigger, I realized that it looked smaller because it was far away, and once it was overhead, it came into clear view. It moved slowly, but it all happened so fast at the same time. It was overhead, over the house, over the pine trees, but under the clouds. It was a black triangle with a textured pattern on the bottom the only side I could see. The texture is difficult to describe. Adidas makes this soccer shoe called the Nemesis. If you Google it, that's kind of how it looked. Embossed lines, perfectly black. The trees were probably about 40 to 50 feet tall, 
so I estimate that this thing was probably 60 to 80 feet off the ground. Pretty low. It was about the size of your traditional Walmart parking lot. It made absolutely zero noise whatsoever. There were no lights. It moved as with intention, with no deviation in direction. Like an air hockey puck, perfectly gliding on a fixed trajectory. It was slow. Maybe faster than a bicycle, but slower than a car. I don't know, 20 miles per hour if I had to guess. Once it made it over the house, I chased it through the gate on the side of the house, yelling to myself at 2.30 in the morning, what the F was that? What the F was that? In the front yard, I was just looking at it. It just quietly and discreetly skated off into the darkness, perfectly straight on, totally indifferent. I regret not getting any pictures, it just didn't occur to me. It came and went so quickly. In the moment, I just didn't know what to think. It's like my brain had nothing to reference against what I was seeing. It wasn't a bird. It was definitely not a plane. I thought maybe it was a drone, but it was so big and totally silent. It was difficult to process in the moment, but I know what I saw. There's no question about it. Anything outside of your scope of understanding or knowledge is the definition of alien. If I were to make up a story about seeing a UFO, a black silent triangle is probably the last thing I would have come up with. I wonder if the flood had anything to do with its presence. It seemed too wild for it to not be connected somehow. The third encounter I had in my life was when I was stargazing with my son on the same deck at the same house. We have since moved though. I was playing with the Google Sky app because I'm lame and uh, it took a while to get a smartphone. So I was amazed at all the apps, even though they'd been out forever. Anyway, we were finding stars on a clear night and then identifying them with the app. One particularly bright star stood out to the east of us and I overlaid the phone with the star. The app showed nothing in the sky in that region. We calibrated it as well. As soon as I said, hey, there's no star there, it zoomed across the horizon, stopped, then zoomed up, then blinked out like an old tube TV turning off. Its movements were very smooth and precise if I were to hold up a yardstick in front of my field of vision with my arms extended, this thing went from one end to the other in a second. I couldn't tell you what that is in actual distance, but it must have been an incredible distance to travel that quickly and to stop on a dime and then redirect and disappear. My son was too young at the time to think much of it. I had heard from the wacky world of UFO conspiracies that UFOs can tell if you notice them, and I had always thought that that was baloney. But I have to admit, this thing tore off the second I noticed it and said something out loud. Pretty weird stuff. So call me crazy, and I'm sure some people will, that's okay. But I swear this happened to me when I was 16. What's weirder is that it happened on the same night that I had an alien abduction dream. My mom wasn't home. She worked nights looking after the elderly at a nearby retirement home. I lived a normal teenage night playing video games, messaging friends, and watching TV. I went to my room and went to sleep. I had an extremely intense nightmare that I was abducted by aliens. All I remembered is looking up in my dream and seeing my whole field of vision turn completely white as I simultaneously heard this really loud buzzing or humming sound. I wake up drenched in sweat, heart pounding, and it's around 5.30 in the morning. But what's weirder is that I'm not in my bed. Confused as heck, I look around the room and to my surprise, I'm somehow in my mom's room, frozen in fear and confused. I tried to figure out what was going on. 
After about 20 to 30 minutes, I finally calmed myself down enough to get up. So I get up and when I go downstairs, I can see through the door to our backyard, which is made of glass, and I can clearly see that the gate to our backyard is wide open. It's an old fashioned wooden gate and it hadn't been opened in years because it was covered in vines and was always left locked. I go to investigate and as I go to unlock the back door, the door handle goes down with no resistance at all. And I realize, crap, this door is already unlocked, which only added to how shook up I was to be honest. So hesitantly, I go into the backyard anyway and I look at the gate, which is also open. I look for footprints or boot marks, thinking that somebody must have kicked the gate open. Nothing. I look more closely. The old rusty lock to the gate, which hasn't been opened in years, is still there. Not bent. Not damaged. Not broken at all. Just a bit rusty. The same as it's always been. I lock that gate back up and look around the yard. Nothing's missing. I go back in the house. I lock the back door and take a real good look around and nothing's missing. I go back to my bedroom and double check that I did get in my bed that night. And yep, I definitely did. The bed's still messy. I thought, did I sleepwalk? Did I go into the yard and then somehow go get in my mom's bed? I checked the carpet and floors in the house which certainly would have been dirty and muddy if I had walked into the yard and then back in. And nothing. I called my mom and explained everything that had happened, and I asked if she had messed with the gate or unlocked it lately. She confirmed that she hadn't, and was just as surprised and confused as I was. To this day, I have no explanation as to what happened that night. Just to confirm, I was very into sports as a teenager, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't take substances, and I was completely sober. I also remember feeling oddly terrified of the sky as it began to get dark out that evening. I remember sometimes that if I was playing football or soccer with friends after that, and it started getting dark, instead of walking home like I usually would, I'd kind of hustle. I'd constantly look up at the sky, feeling fear, and I remember a number of times where I decided to just run home instead because I was scared, even months later. All of this still confuses me, even to this day. One night while driving home, I saw a huge bright light, probably a little larger than a full moon, straight ahead of me in the sky. It changed colors from green to yellow, red, blue, and then two other similar lights showed up next to it. They changed colors for about 10 to 15 seconds. Then they all became one big white light and completely disappeared. Then they all came back, changed colors more, and then disappeared for good. I've just never seen anything like this, but I was wondering if anyone else had similar sightings. About two months ago, I was driving home from my parents' house late at night on a route that connects New York to Connecticut. My town in Connecticut directly borders New York State. The town has some serious hills bordering on small mountains. At one point on the route, the trees thin out to the left, revealing a large hill or small mountain, which can be seen pretty clearly from different perspectives for about two minutes. As I was driving on this particular night, I noticed two large, slow blinking and slow moving rectangular lights low in the sky. I couldn't see any specific features of any craft surrounding these lights, so my perspective could be off, but it seemed to me to be only about 20 meters higher than the top of the hill. 
I'm guessing the distance or height by how fuzzy the edges of the light seem to be and by how large they appear to be. In addition to the multiple perspectives provided by my consistent 40 miles per hour speed on the road. When I spotted it, it was nearly directly forward in my line of sight, off to the left just a bit. In the two minutes that I watched it, it moved maybe a half a mile farther to my left. For reference, the top of the hill that I mentioned is about a mile from that road in the same direction to the left. That would mean a speed of about 15 miles per hour. The lights were blinking too slowly to be standard aircraft strobes, on for about two seconds, off for another two, in a regular rhythm. They were moving and blinking in unison, which implies that they were both part of one larger thing. They seemed to be set about 30 to 40 yards apart from one another. There was no noticeable sound and no witnesses aside from myself that I know of. I had always thought that if I saw a UFO, I would love to follow it, but I was too freaked out and I didn't do that. I felt like an instinctive horror. I couldn't bring myself to deliberately get closer. If there is a next time, I will try harder to overcome that. The year was 1976. We were living in the Middle East. My father was in the secret police called Savak. It was common that a helicopter would land in our backyard and pick my dad up for a mission or something like that. One night, I saw a bright light and it got my attention. I thought it was my dad returning home on the helicopter landing in the backyard, but I guess it wasn't. But I don't remember anything after the light got really close. I woke up in bed the next day. Well, I thought it was the next day, but I found out that a few days had actually passed. My father was standing next to my bed with two well-dressed men. One was American, I think, and the other was a translator. He introduced one of them as Mr. John and told me they wanted to talk to me. I was confused and they asked a lot of weird questions. Soon after my dad took me, my brother and sister moved us to the UK. We lived there for three years until my next strange encounter. Once again, one of the original two men, Mr. John, with a new guy, questioned me once more. A few months later on the 4th of July, 1979, we moved to the US and we have lived here ever since. As time went by, I asked my dad questions about the moving and the men questioning me but he would never talk about it until recently when he was diagnosed with dementia. The things he said were incredible, too incredible to be true. I thought it was the drugs or the disease. I thought that's pretty cool if it was true, but there's no way. Well, he's in a nursing home here in Laguna Hills, California, and I went to go visit him. When I walked into his room, to my surprise, he had a visitor. A man. Not just any man, but the one that had met with me twice before. A face that I'll always remember. The only problem was that the last time I saw him was 35 to 40 years prior, and he hadn't aged a day. I was older than him. He saw me, pulled his cap down to cover his face, and left without a word. I asked my dad who he was, and he said to me, that's Mr. John. And remember, buy safe mood. I can't make heads or tails of it to this day. I was 10 years old. My brother and I were the last ones off the bus from school every day. We were nearing my house, which is in the Midwest countryside. Lots of cows and trees and fields, stuff like that. Anyway, about a mile away from my house, I look out the window and I see an orange blimp in the sky. Standard American football shaped blimp. 
Surprisingly, I didn't think anything of it. Because a day or so before that, a bunch of kids and I at recess saw a blue blimp in the sky. I watched it, thought it was cool to see a blimp this far outside of town, especially near my house, and wasn't about to think another thing of it. After a few seconds, the blimp shifted from a football shape to a star, literally just shrunk before my eyes into a tiny, shiny dot that resembled a star in the night sky. Except it wasn't a star. It was just a blimp a second ago. Not even two seconds after it shifted, it launched even farther into the sky, shot down to its original height, and then shot completely off into space. It was the most bizarre thing I had ever experienced. I was a quiet kid, but being the last kid on the bus besides my brother, I shouted about it. When I got off the bus, I ran to my mother to tell her, like a crazy old man yelling about the end times. My mother said that I was crazy, naturally, and I never told my dad, because my mom shut me down pretty hard and it killed my mood. Fast forward years later, shortly after I turned 22, my dad and I took a short road trip to go pick up a car he bought halfway across the state. We talked about a lot and somehow got on the topic of UFOs. He told me that when he was 12 or 13, he and his brothers were playing down by a creek near their house, which by the way, was only a few miles away from our house. They saw an orange football shaped object in the sky. I was absolutely blown away when he said that. My father is skeptical and doesn't believe in this kind of stuff, ever. But when I shared my story, he paused and said that it was very odd to have seen the exact same thing behave the exact same way more than 30 years apart. I'll start out by saying that I've seen my fair share of strange things in the skies, but one memory will always stand out amongst the others. I've done the math and I believe it was fall of 2005. I was in sixth grade, outside on the phone with my first boyfriend. I'd say it was between six to eight o'clock Eastern time at night. It was dark outside and only our back porch light was on. I was talking up a storm and I was watching my two dogs roam the backyard. Out of nowhere, it was like somebody turned on a blue light above us, the dogs and I. It was a bright, beautiful electric blue. I immediately looked up and saw what I can best describe as the shape of an eye, but perfectly symmetrical in the same blue color. It was lined with an almost holographic looking light a constantly changing rainbow of colors. I stared for maybe two seconds before it closed up, leaving only the colorful outline. It immediately shot to the left like a shooting star and disappeared. In shock, I told my boyfriend I would call him back and I immediately ran to my parents who were folding clothes in the bedroom. I shouted at them, I just saw aliens. They laughed at first and told me to stop joking, but my father knows my eyes. He saw my panic and quickly changed the subject. I've never forgotten this moment. I can still see it so clearly, even to this day. What did I see? Why did I see it? Can anyone help? On the evening of September 7th, 2006, my friend Jen and I were driving home from a friend's house near to where the Big Ear Radio Observatory used to be. It was somewhere around 10 p.m., near the corner of Cheshire Road and Route 23 between Delaware, Ohio, and Lewis Center, Ohio. We were driving down Route 23, heading south toward Lewis Center, when Jen saw a bright light very distant in the sky. We both jokingly said, 
It's probably a UFO. So we keep driving and we eventually lose sight and forget about the distant object in the sky. Then, as we're coming over the precipice of a hill, just beyond where the golf course is now, where the telescope once stood there, was an enormous glowing football-shaped UFO hanging right above our heads, steadily moving over top of Route 23, heading toward Lewis Center. It was the most frightening and awe-inspiring thing I have ever witnessed. We stopped on the side of the highway and got out of the car. It was the largest thing I've ever seen. I felt like an ant beneath the giant glowing boot. The object looked like it was engulfed in some orangish reddish plasma, almost like what the surface of the sun looks like close up from space. It looked as though it had flames bubbling and churning within it. I tried to take a video with my Motorola Razor, but the phone just would not pick it up at all even though it had been working just fine and had nearly a full charge. It slowly begins to back away from us a bit and begins floating toward the town of Lewis Center. We follow it back to Lewis Center, where my friends and I watch it for nearly an hour, and eventually it begins to gain altitude in a dizzying display of lights. Then it flashes and blasts it away in the blink of an eye, leaving behind a wispy blue teal vapor trail. I found out later on that the Big Ear Radio Observatory in Delaware, Ohio, was where they had received the WOW signal in 1977. This object took up a large portion of the visible sky as we came upon it. I'm an airman. I have been trained to observe and identify aircraft. I would estimate the object to be the size of an NFL football stadium just floating above the tree line highway and houses and buildings. The object was witnessed by at least five people other than myself. As it was gaining altitude, glowing bluish purplish orbs began to cascade out of the main shaped object, one after the other. Each time they would appear, they would revolve around the main object intensify until all I could see was a spinning blue glow around that main football stadium object. And then in the blink of an eye, it shot off into a flash of light in front of it, like the Enterprise going to warp speed, leaving only a bluish trailing haze behind. The whole experience was the most profound thing to have ever happened to me in my lifetime up till that point. Thank you for hearing my account of what occurred. This Sunday gone, my girlfriend and I, who live in Adelaide, Australia, had just gone on a dinner date. She is a 26-year-old female and I am a 24-year-old female. We went to her house to drop off her doggy bag. Then we drove back toward my house, southward. About halfway between our houses, I noticed three lights in the sky in a perfect triangle. It was very odd and the lights were fairly obvious in the dark sky, especially because there were also stars visible, so the lights were very visibly different. They were a lot brighter and bigger, though not by much. I pointed it out to her, and immediately she said, Holy cow, what the heck is that? At first I thought I might be seeing things, but when she reacted, I knew it wasn't just my eyes playing tricks. We quickly noticed that the lights were moving at about the same speed we were and had started to flash green and red sporadically. We decided to follow it for as long as we feasibly could. It was a bit of a thrill, if I'm being completely honest, following the mystery lights in the sky, but it also didn't last very long. Maybe five minutes past my house, the lights took a turn, sped up, and just disappeared. We pulled over to see if we could find it again, but we didn't have any luck. We kept talking about how strange and cool the whole thing was. I am telling my story here to see if anyone else has seen something like this or has any ideas of what it could have been besides a UFO. 
Our first thought was a helicopter, but there's no realistic way for a perfect triangle of lights to come off of that. And they moved way too quickly. If anyone has ideas, I'd love to hear them. I can't quite understand this one myself, so maybe you guys can help. This was on the 11th of July, 2019. My boyfriend and I, he's now my husband, were camping in the mountains, very high up. This area is so high up and remote that there is virtually no light pollution, so you can see almost every star in the sky when it's a clear night, like this one was. We were just relaxing, staring at the stars, usual romantic things you do in the mountains, when we started noticing the stars acting very differently. They appeared to zigzag and go upward, almost like they were playing with one another, weaving near each other and away again in circular motions. We were just amazed by it all and couldn't take our eyes off the sky. This went on for about two to three solid hours. That wasn't the strangest part though. Where we were camping, there was a clear view of an opening between two other mountains. At around 2 a.m., maybe three, I noticed this bright light between the two mountains. It was really bright, so I nudged my partner to look over too. We were staring at this massive white yellow looking star go upward quickly, then noticed it was going toward us. My partner is a man that isn't easily scared and this really scared him to the point that he nearly broke my nose trying to hide fully in the tent with both of us screaming as this star just stopped right above us. When it was above us, right before we both panicked, it seemed to have a diamond type shape and it was super bright. But that isn't the strangest part. When we were in the tent, the light didn't shine through the tent. This thing didn't make a single noise. So it wasn't a drone or anything like that. It was far too big. And what seemed like seconds later, we were both calm looking at the stars again like nothing happened until sunrise. If both of us hadn't experienced this, if it was just one of us, I could try to make an excuse for it. But we both confirm each other's stories and saw the same exact thing, and I can't explain it. To top it all off, when I'm talking about it, or in this case typing, it feels like I'm lying and my partner feels the same way, like it never happened. It feels like I'm making it up. And the more I try to remember about that night, the more I can't remember. And he feels the same way too. It's like whenever I go to tell my story, something is actively trying to get me to believe that I didn't see what I saw or to stop talking about it. Has anyone else ever experienced anything like this? Does anyone have some answers? I'd love to know. This happened three to four years ago, and I've been thinking about it recently. It was late one night, around 11.30 p.m., and I was driving home from my job at Sonic. I was taking US Route 64 home, which is a fairly desolate stretch of road with houses and farmland on either side. I was in my 99 Ford Explorer, and I was just driving along around 65 to 70 miles per hour with the radio on low volume. As I'm driving, through the sunroof comes a bright green ray of light that envelops the interior of my vehicle. This lasts for about two to three seconds. Then it disappears without a trace. After that happened, I just sped up and got home as quickly as possible. I was only about five minutes away. 
That's really about all there was to it, but I was really freaked out. I have pondered and pondered, but I have no clue what that could have been. I wasn't tired, because I woke up at around 5 or 6 that day, and I have no history of any illnesses that could have caused this. I wasn't on any medications. I've told a few people, and I don't think that they believe I'm lying. I've never been the kind to lie about that kind of thing, but no one can give me a solid answer either. Some have said maybe it was a laser, but I don't think there's any way a laser could completely cover my vehicle in green light like that. There was a farm that I was passing by, but it wasn't lit and there were no street lights. I have no idea what it was that I encountered. This isn't my story, but it's something that happened to my parents just a bit ago. They live in western New York, upstate, and are really open to all kinds of supernatural stuff. My dad has reason to believe in aliens for reasons other than this encounter, but that's a story for another day. It might be a good time to add here that my parents do not use drugs or alcohol, and they're very sharp as far as memory, cognizance and intuition go. I'm going to copy and paste a message that my mom sent me and just read it for you, if that's okay. I just figured I'd put some feelers out there and see if anybody else has experienced something similar or has any sort of explanation. Quote, Last weekend, we were coming back from Jamestown. Dad and I saw a freaking UFO or something. Between Randolph and Steinberg, there was this huge, really bright light blinking on and off in the sky directly in front of us, and it was falling from the sky, except it was shooting directly downward. I thought it was a falling star at first, but after it blinked repeatedly, I thought, that is not a falling star. And even though I thought that it might have been a plane, I knew that it was too bright and going too fast to be one. Plus, as far as I know, planes don't make a habit of going straight down. Then, all of a sudden, it was gone. Like, mid-sky. And I thought, well, it must have gone behind a hill or a mountain or into the trees. So, right then, I said, did you see that? And Dad goes, what the F was that? He said that he was thinking the same things that I was. And at the same time, we both noticed... There are no hills. There is no mountain. There's nothing for this thing to go behind. It was just cornfields and open space. This thing just disappeared. Next thing you know, it was directly behind us, mid-sky, and it shot directly upward, back up into the sky. I was looking out my rearview mirror, and it lit up the whole sky, like an aura all around but the brightness of it was still really bright white. Dad was turned around watching it, and it started following us. We had that same eerie feeling we had when we saw the Bigfoot that one time, and we were saying, what the F is that? All of a sudden, it just disappeared. They have no idea what it was that they experienced, and yes, they do also have a Bigfoot sighting, but that's a story for another day as well. Either way, they've been trying to figure out what in the world they saw, so I thought I'd share their story and see if anybody else had any ideas. My mom is very religious and no nonsense. She grew up Brethren, which is basically an old form of Baptist that doesn't really exist anymore. Despite her upbringing, she's always been interested in aliens. I think it's because her dad also had an obsession with them, but I don't know why. Maybe he saw something during his trucking and military days. As a kid, I always caught my mom watching those alien and UFO shows. She really wanted to see a UFO for herself. 
One night, she was traveling down the Appalachian Mountains in western North Carolina, coming from a festival in eastern Tennessee. It was fall, so the leaves were beginning to become bare, and you could see through them. She was driving along with my sister and my grandmother when she sees what looks like three to five lights in a circular shape. It's getting really close. My sister and grandmother notice it too. Soon, it appears to be behind them, very low to the ground. My mom opens the sunroof and windows, but there's not a sound coming from anywhere. Then, something my mom describes as an opaque white column comes down onto the road behind her car and is following. Like, the distance between the white column and the car never changes. My mom went from curious to freaked and guns it. I think the total time it followed was probably less than a minute. Eventually, it went away without a trace. When my mom finally got home that night and told me about it, I thought she would be excited, but it nearly scared her to death. She said she had always wanted to see a UFO, but that once she did, the experience left her terrified. I remember she complained about being unable to sleep for the next few nights. This was 10 or so years ago, but she still doesn't seem to talk about aliens with such frequency anymore. Back in 2011, on a family vacation in Jamaica, my siblings and I were sitting on the beach stargazing. That is, until we noticed this one point of light that was moving unnaturally and without sound. It had the brightest color, and it looked kind of like a dim star, except that it was moving in circular and figure eight type patterns. For perspective, the patterns were no bigger in diameter than the little dipper's cup. It was moving with the pattern and speed reminiscent of when one uses a laser pointer to get a cat's attention. 15 to 20 minutes after noticing it, it just faded away. Could this have been a weather balloon? It definitely wasn't a plane, a helicopter, or a satellite. At least none like the ones I've ever seen. I'm trying to find images of weather balloons from the ground at night, but every image is too close up or simply doesn't look at all like what I saw. In my life, I think I have seen a UFO twice. I just want to know what everybody thinks. Number one. I was 14 and I was in Spain. I was looking up at the night sky when suddenly this kind of round thing flew low overhead. From what I remember, it was round with yellow and small white lights around the underside. It was really odd. I remember seeing it, but my family says it never happened. But I know what I saw. Number two. This one originally looked like a star sitting outside the back of our house one night, we were all looking up, and we saw this star moving across the sky. We were all like, oh look, a satellite. We were tracking it going west. But then, things got strange. It stopped and started going west. You might say, oh well, perhaps it was a plane. Planes don't move like that. It stopped again, then went north, and then, it just disappeared, just blinked out. Did I see a UFO? A few years ago, I temporarily lived in a cabin out in the woods with my friend due to some unexpected life circumstances. One night, we had another friend over, and all three of us had a smoke session in the backyard at about 3 a.m. 
That was when we started to hear a strange noise in the woods. It kind of sounded like a humming engine coming closer to us. Suddenly, my friend shouts in confusion as he explains that he briefly got blinded by a distant light. A few seconds later, my other friend notices a flying object near the treetops, about 40 meters away. When he points out that the object is see-through and that you can actually see the outlines of the treetops behind it, we are all just stunned and we just look in awe, in complete silence, until the object spirals away super fast up toward the sky in a manner that is certainly not possible with any known technology we have. Then it disappeared. We rushed inside and my friend had the brilliant idea to have everybody draw what they had seen simultaneously without looking at each other's to confirm what we saw. We all showed our pictures at the same time and we all drew the exact same thing. We kicked ourselves over not recording the event for proof, but later realized that all of us had left our phones inside while going out to smoke. We joked about the light scanning us to see if we had any recording devices on us. We all went to bed, with both of them sleeping upstairs, and with myself being downstairs, alone. As I lay down, pondering over the experience and feeling a bit uneasy, I suddenly see two orbs floating around the room. One was red, and one was blue. I get a bit freaked out and pretend to be asleep while I watch these orbs float around for about five minutes, then they disappeared. Eventually, I fell asleep, and when I woke up the next day, I was eager to share my experience. They informed me that when they woke up and went outside, the door handle crumbled in their hands, like all of the components of the door handle had been dismantled. It was a very surreal experience overall. Aliens, advanced technology not known to the public, I don't know, but it certainly gives me this childlike hope that there's more to this life than the dull reality we live in. So recently, I've been having really weird things happen at my house. Not only somewhat ghost-related, but also UFO sightings at the same time. I just wanted to tell a couple of stories about my first ever UFO encounter. So I was lying in bed. It was around 1130 at night, and I'm leaning to the side of the patio door from my bedroom. I'm thinking for a while when I look through the blinds to see what looked to be a glowing object hovering above my neighbor's house. On the rim of this craft, there seemed to be a color changing rainbow and then a few lights around it blinking. My neighbor has this really rich friend that sometimes comes to visit in his helicopter. And that's what I thought it was at first, but I swear there was absolutely no sound. I also suspected that maybe it could be a star that flashes, but it was way too close. If it was a drone, it would have made some sound, especially that close. I was amazed at this craft and I didn't know what to think. Once I got back in bed, I heard what sounded like a plane circling my house. I didn't see it, but I heard it. I thought it could be a plane, but it sounded almost fake. I'm guessing if it was the UFO, they were trying to mask the sound of it or make themselves appear like something normal. When I took a look back at my neighbor's property, the craft was gone. Another story happened about the same time that I saw this other thing. Again, it was around 1130 at night. And again, I was lying in bed, looking out the window and just sort of daydreaming. Again, I could see a light. It was glowing really white and almost pulsating. I didn't want to go see what it was in fear that it could be ETs. From these experiences, I've decided to see what it is and investigate it. I really want to go confront them. I really want to go see what they are.
I live outside of Melbourne, Australia. This is the crazy experience that I just had recently. I was outside on my deck having a smoke, and I looked up at the sky. Suddenly, two stars appeared directly on top of each other, evenly spaced. Then a third star appeared directly under the second star, again evenly spaced. Another star appeared blinking and moving toward the first star, then went down toward the second, then down to the third, and then away. It was moving very slowly, and each star was blinking in a pattern. I called my partner outside to verify what I saw, and he confirmed that I wasn't crazy and witnessed the moving stars slowly move in patterns that normal craft or satellites couldn't move in. It was going up and down and away and then back at a consistent slow speed. Something clearly had control over it. It was remarkable. We checked again a little bit later and all three stars were gone. I chatted to my housemate about it. Sadly, he was in his room at the time and didn't witness it. He said that my friend and her partner that live about 15 minutes away witnessed the exact same thing months ago. I called my friend and she confirmed that they saw the exact same thing, and then her partner confirmed it as well. They even confirmed the direction they had seen it in from local landmarks and buildings, which completely matched the direction that we had seen it in. So four people have witnessed something similar in a space of like three months in our small town. Super weird. Back when I was a child, I had a weird UFO experience. My dad had bought a new Ford truck after his beloved Bronco had to go. We went on a visit to my grandma's place on the reservation. We picked her up and we all went fishing together and had a really nice picnic. I remember that I had this really cool Disney swimming pool. Anyway, we were all driving home when this huge aircraft of some kind appeared on the way to San Carlos, Arizona. It was not on some secluded dirt or back road. It was on Interstate 70 between Globe and Paradox. It was huge. It was like the size of a Zeppelin. It had lights all along its length, which flashed blue, red, yellow, and green in about one second. We were stunned. It sat there for quite a long time in one spot. We passed an ambulance coming the other way, and also a police officer who pulled over in our lane looking up at this thing. I was very young, but I was there with my parents and my grandma. My grandma has since passed on, but my parents still remember it. My mom calls the lights on the side of the UFO windows, but to me, they just looked like a row of extremely bright lights. It stayed stationary for a long while before suddenly moving south to the top of Mount Turnbull. Then it went straight upwards and disappeared into the sky. The moon was out and the only clouds were above the summit. I think about this experience from time to time, and sometimes I doubt myself as to whether or not any of it happened. But there were three adults in the truck who saw it, and a police officer on the side of the road too. I wish I could find the other people who saw it and ask if they remember it too. I'm going to try to make this short by stating just the simple facts of what I witnessed during two separate incidents. Incident number one. This is going back to the late summer of either 1989 or 1990. I was at work with two coworkers near Rhinebeck, New York. One of my coworkers was outside smoking when he called to me and another coworker to come outside and see something. When we exited the front door, we saw the classic V-shaped craft hovering above a tree in the front yard. 
It was directly above the tree, which was just about the height of the building. Two stories, so maybe 30 feet. I ran up to the tree, which put the craft those same 30 feet above me. It had five to seven white lights, with the largest at the bottom center of the V, with the others running up from it. It made no noise, and even though whatever it was blocked out the sky, I couldn't make out a structure or body. It very slowly and silently started heading across the street and over a hill. My two co-workers went inside, but I remained in case it came back. It did. When it reappeared from behind the hill, the shape had changed. The lights were now in a straight line and were more of an orange color. It headed back toward my location, changing shape as it moved. The light formations just kept shifting. It took on the shape of a diamond, then an X, then back to a V, before it moved directly over the building. It kept going in that direction and then headed south and out of sight. Incident number two. I was at home. Having recently moved into a new apartment, things weren't all organized and my new bed had not arrived, so I fell asleep on the floor. I should also mention here that I am an incredibly heavy sleeper. During the night, I woke up from a sound sleep and sat straight up. This was something that I had never done. Anyway, the corner of the room was lit up with what looked like dozens of very pale, multicolored lights. Staring at them, I noticed a shadow of a figure out of the corner of my right eye. It looked as though it was moving closer, and then, well, that's all I remember. The next day I woke up not immediately remembering what I had seen. All of the clocks in the house were either stopped at or flashing at 3 a.m. Even the VCR flashed that time and was also playing even though there was no tape in it. I had to unplug everything that had an electronic clock in the apartment in order to reset and fix things. It wasn't until I was doing that that I remembered what had taken place. I've been told that I should try hypnosis regarding the second incident, but I'm not really sure that I trust the practice. One of my friends is actually a licensed hypnotherapist, or whatever you call them, but I still don't know. In all honesty, I don't know if I want to know. I thought I'd share a few stories that I heard from my ex-boyfriend's mom that I thought were pretty fascinating. We're all from the same reservation, so I can explain the setting pretty well. Basically, there's this one bush road that takes you from the reserve deep into the woods until you get to another town. But that stretch of dirt road goes on for about 45 minutes. I think it was an old logging road once, but now we just call it the limit. And we use that area of the forest for camping, fishing, ski-doo riding, and four-wheeler riding. Stuff like that. It's also just a chill road to drive down with your friends. If you're from a small town, you know how it is. Anyway, she had two paranormal experiences on this particular road, which isn't entirely out of the ordinary. My dad has even had an experience on this road too. It's kind of known for all sorts of strange things happening, but it's fine. Nobody's scared of it. I still go drive down it to watch pretty sunsets. It's just chill like that. The first story is about a weird time loop. She and her cousin were driving down this road to go get some water, since there was also a natural spring around there. On their way back, their car stalls out and just won't start up again. This happened back in the 80s, so there weren't any cell phones you could use to call for help. So they started walking. They weren't too far and they had plenty of daylight left, so it was fine. But as they're walking, they see another car stopped in the distance. They think, oh cool, we can get a ride from these guys. But as they get closer, they see that it's the same make and model of their car. 
they get even closer and they realize that no, it's the same car. They're confused as heck, but can completely verify that it is their car by looking in the windows. The sweater she left in the back seat, the empty pop can her cousin was drinking out of. Everything inside was exactly as they had left it. And honestly, they just didn't know what to do. They hadn't turned off that dirt road at all. They hadn't even walked far enough to make it to another trail that they could turn off on. They thought it was weird, but figured they should just keep walking as it's all they could do. They keep going and sure enough, up ahead down the road, there's a parked car, the same as before. This time they are tripping out and they run up to it and yep, it is 100% their car again. Her cousin gets a stick from the woods and leaves it on the hood of the car, saying that if they keep walking and the same things happen, at least they can see if the stick would have been moved. They take off walking and it happens again. This time, the stick is gone. She described the feeling of being afraid that the time loop would just go on forever, but it didn't. The next time they walked down the road, they realized they were able to walk farther and eventually they made it back to the reservation. They got help and towed the car, but never got an explanation or figured out what happened with the car and the time loop. She has no idea why the stick that they left on the hood of the car disappeared. And I don't have any idea either. The second story is about a UFO sighting she had with some friends on that same road. This happened years later, after the first incident, maybe in the early 90s, and it was during the summertime. She and her friends were riding around in a car, having a few beers, not the driver, obviously, and listening to music. One of their friends commented that there must be a four-wheeler in the woods, but that it's weird since there were no trails there. They look over to see what he's talking about, and all they can see are these white lights emanating from deep in the woods. They could see that there's a source of light, but they couldn't see the object itself through the trees. The driver slows down and turns down the music. She says that there wasn't anything too alarming about what they were seeing at that point, but that there was just this feeling that something wasn't right. And she said that everyone felt it because all of them got quiet as they looked out the windows, which were wide open. When things got quiet, they were able to hear a low humming. She had a hard time describing the humming, just that it was very low, but that it almost felt like ringing in the ears. They all heard it. They were silent looking at the lights, but then whatever it was shot up directly into the sky and they saw a UFO. This was so long ago that she told me about it and that it happened that I wish I could describe more about how it looked but she did say that the second it shot into the sky, it changed into all sorts of colors that seemed to rotate around the craft. It paused right above the tree line for a few seconds, and then it just took off right into the horizon, lights changing again when it moved. Those are her experiences. It's weird too, that everyone's experiences on this road are so vastly different. There are some sightings of creatures from our Algonquin folklore. There's Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, time loops. And then I have other friends who just heard really creepy singing that got closer and closer with no source. We also just found out that our entire reservation is sitting atop a huge uranium deposit. Apparently it's the largest in our province, but I'm not sure. Nuclear mining companies keep trying to build mines and we keep refusing. I'm wondering if that has something to do with it, because the amount of paranormal things that happened around here is pretty wild. I've had over a week to think about this, and I can't come up with a satisfactory, rational explanation. I live in the north coast of Northern Ireland, not far from the Giant's Causeway, 
just to give some reference that people might know. Just over a week ago, I was sitting watching television with my wife. I sit by one of the windows sometimes because there's a plug-in for my laptop there. My wife was sitting on the other sofa, so she couldn't see out of this particular window. It was around 8.30 and perfectly dark outside. If I looked out, I could see the lights of our local town, Ballymoney. It's tiny, more of a village, really. Just as at the scene, we're about three miles out, surrounded by farmland. Anyway, I'm watching TV and occasionally glancing out the window, when suddenly I see this bright light just over the fields. It's multicolored, and it kind of blooms, growing larger. At first I thought it was a firework, which would have been bizarre enough in late March, in the middle of the lockdown. Except it's too slow, if that makes sense. It brightened into maybe three different colors. It was hard to judge distances in the dark, but if I had to guess, I'd say that it was two acres or more away and larger than a family car, hanging maybe 80 to 100 feet up, pretty low. Eventually, it faded and disappeared again, not behaving anything like a firework and far too large to be a flare. I said at the time that I thought I had seen somebody letting off fireworks. A few minutes later, I glanced out again and there's a smaller light roving around in the same spot but it vanished almost the moment I looked at it. This light was maybe a third of the size of the original and was moving left to right. I've thought about it ever since. The annual Ballymoney Town firework display is much further away and we can always hear it from home. Yet this was soundless. Helicopters and drones don't have lights like that. And again, if there had been a chopper out there so low and so close, we'd have heard it. A drone still strikes me as most likely. We wouldn't have heard it inside the house, and I guess it might have been rigged with powerful lights, but they would have had to have been incredibly powerful. So, I don't know. I've never, ever seen or heard a drone over that area in the daytime, and I'm out there all the time. Honestly, I think maybe I saw a UFO. No lights in the sky were reported in local news or on social media, though, and I haven't seen anything since, so who knows? Tonight, August 4th of 2019, at around 10.15, my aunt and I were on the porch when my aunt saw something in the sky. It was like an outline of a circle, and part of it was gone, kind of like how an eclipsed moon would look at first. We noted that this was not where the moon usually is. Usually it's behind our house. So eclipse and moon were ruled out. The thing was bright yellow and had an orange-red tint to it, it almost looked like a fireball. It's night, and the sun is on the other side of the planet at this minute, so wasn't that either. We thought it was a shooting star at first, but it wasn't moving anywhere. It started like flattening out, like spreading. Then it started to shrink into a smaller form and kind of looked like a star. Then all of a sudden, it disappeared. A few minutes later, it suddenly reappeared and got bigger and bigger. It looked as if the moon would have been over the sun and coming off of it, moving toward the way it came in the first time. The light around it kind of spread out again. Then suddenly, it started getting smaller, like the dark part of the eclipse was going back over. Then it split into two and completely disappeared. We waited to see if it would come back but it didn't come back for the third time. I started doing some research and found nothing for solar or lunar eclipses that described what we saw. No meteor showers, no eclipses even happened in our area, no comets, nothing of the sort for that night. After doing some more searching, two other people saw almost the same thing three days ago around the same time. 
My aunt stepped back outside and called me over, fast. There was what looked to be a pretty low plane flying with two large wings. My aunt says it looked like it had four wings, two on either side, and I'm telling you this thing was big. One side was bright red and the other was bright green. Planes in our area normally have a small light that flickers on both sides. It wasn't like this at all. This plane was coming from the same area that we had seen these mystery light things in. And when the plane got behind our house, I ran to look at it and I couldn't see it at all. It was big, like I said. It shouldn't have been out of view already. My aunt and I have been trying to come up with a logical explanation, but nothing makes any sense. I don't want to claim aliens, but I don't know what else it could have been. I will start by saying I was a devout skeptic before this experience. It has changed me. It was the summer of 2016, a few months after my sister was born, and my family and I had some old family friends over at our house. We'd been hanging out nearly all day, and it was getting to be around the time of sunset. My friend and I, who I'll refer to as Adam, went on a walk to the ponds in my neighborhood and stayed there for what I remember being about 30 to 45 minutes, just enough time for it to become dark enough to see the stars. At this point, we begin the short walk back to my house when I noticed a star in the sky, which appeared to be moving. I tell Adam this, and he says that he too can see it. At this point, we're standing at the end of my driveway, looking up at the sky. We watched the star for roughly five minutes when we noticed two other stars, all of which are moving toward each other at around the same speed. Now this is where it begins to get really weird. Adam pulls out his phone and attempts to record it, but it ends up being too dimly lit for his phone's camera to see, sadly. Nearly immediately after Adam had put his phone away, all of the stars had stopped in a blank patch of sky, devoid of all other lights and stars, and formed a large triangle. These lights then began moving as one unit and turning clockwise in the sky. They remained in this formation and movement for nearly five minutes before stopping, then proceeded to move at a speed which I've never seen before, away from each other, and disappeared into the night. Based on the reactions of people back at the house, both Adam and I were visibly shaken up. When we tried to explain what had happened, they shrugged it off, as us just not knowing what we saw. I know what I saw, and so does Adam. Green Cove Springs has a history of military and government establishments and compounds, none of which are currently active. However, there is a significant amount of military infrastructure still in use as housing and places of business. It makes me wonder if this had something to do with some sort of test flight. Either way, we saw what we saw, even if we don't know what it is. Before I begin, let me give you some background. I was about 13 at the time, not under the influence of any narcotics or medications, nor have I taken any mind-altering substances since then. I had just come back from a class trip to Washington, D.C. It was late, maybe around seven or eight at night. My father picked me up at the airport and we began driving home on the highway. And that's when I saw it. It was an unknown distance away and looked close and far at the same time. It was a gray steel color and had, well, it was honestly very stereotypical for the most part. It was in the shape of like ravioli. It was a round, perfectly circular, 
ravioli shape with a bulge on both sides of the middle and a ring of lights around it. The lights were all large and gave off a light that was very hard to describe. They were blue, yellow, and white all at the same time. And yet they didn't give off any kind of flare or beam. And when the craft moved, they didn't give a typical trail that you would get when looking at a light moving out of a car window. Now, the craft moved so perfectly, it looked as if it wasn't moving at all. It matched the exact speed of our car, which, if you've ever driven down I-95, is really quite an impressive task. I tried to get my father's attention because I needed some confirmation that I was indeed seeing what I was seeing. In those days, things were a bit strained between us due to some issues at home. So he grumpily brushed me off and kept driving. It felt like this went on for a while, but after the event, I realized it couldn't have been more than a few minutes due to the time on the dashboard clock. Things got very odd very quickly. The craft, while keeping perfectly matched with our car, started moving on its side where it was nearly impossible to see except for the bulges. It then did something that I will truly never forget. It split in half, but in a way that was so mechanically perfect, I knew right then it wasn't man-made. The way it split was as it was moving, and there was no jittering or stalling or any evidence of anything mechanical that could have allowed it to separate, let alone be held together in the first place. After it split for a few moments, it kept pace with the car, then each half, while still on its side, shot across the sky at blinding speeds in separate directions. And that's the story. Make of it what you will, but I swear by this sighting. It was an amazing experience that showed me we truly understand nothing about our universe. Ever since I was 13, in 2008, I've developed an interest in aliens and UFOs. I've grown enough of an interest to actually create a scrapbook of pictures of UFOs, declassified government documents, newspaper clippings, and things like that. All of these things were available from Google. I even recorded my own UFO sightings here and there, but I eventually threw them out because I was worried that I was sticking my nose where it didn't belong. In any case, this is one of my UFO experiences. It was somewhere between 2009 and 2011. I was around 14 to 16. It was around 8 or 9 p.m., and I was looking into the sky to see if I might get lucky and find a UFO. I noticed a large triangular-shaped silhouette facing west into my backyard. It was huge, and it had a red light at the center. Parts of the craft warped into a boomerang shape. One part was invisible at times, and the other part wasn't. It was as if it had some invisible shield that was on and then off. It was able to change its shape from a boomerang and then into a triangle and then just disappear. In the past, I've had other UFO experiences, but this one was the most convincing one of my whole life. Does anyone else have any UFO experiences? If you do, I'd love to hear them. I saw a UFO and I just want to know if there's some kind of explanation for what I saw. I didn't have my phone with me, so I don't have any evidence. But I did see a UFO. At first I thought it was a glare, but the moon was behind me and I was seeing Orion's belt and some other stars in front of me. The first one I saw was on the left. Then I realized it was moving in one direction, so it couldn't be a glare. It was going northward. I 
also don't think that it was a plane because of the lockdown. Planes weren't really allowed to fly, and if they were, it was really limited. I definitely know what a plane looks and sounds like, and this was not it. The thing that I saw was just silently cruising in the sky. Seconds later, I saw one to the right. I saw small dots emitting light. It was as small as what stars look like at night, but they weren't twinkling, and the lighted dots were aligned in a constant position. I also saw that it changed its angle a bit after I saw the lighted dots. I asked myself if they could have been birds, migrating or passing by, because sometimes flocks of birds fly in a V-shape, but that doesn't explain the glow. I'm not sure how high it was exactly in the sky, but it was definitely in the zone where a plane might fly, but it was way too big to be a plane. It was cruising for a good few seconds until it literally just vanished. Would there be any other explanation? Is that what a stealth bomber looks like at night? It was definitely a UFO because it was an object flying in the sky and I didn't know what it was. So it was an unidentified flying object. I just want to know if it was alien or not. I wanted to share a few UFO encounters that I've had. The first was when I was about 11. I was riding home with my dad in the car. I looked out the window and saw a ship. It was shaped more like a small city, black with multiple spires. I told my dad and he saw it as well and gunned it home. The odd part was his reaction, which is connected to the next encounter. I asked about the ship and he went ape shit, started screaming about nothing being there and that we never saw anything, even though he described it when I pointed it out. Fast forward to about four years ago, which makes me around 34 years old at the time. I was at work at the hotel and the housekeeper calls me over. It's Veterans Day, so I figure she wants me to check out the parade. Instead, she points out a white sphere in the sky. We stare at it and it moves at an insane speed, then splits into six smaller spheres. I tell her, congratulations on your first UFO sighting. It keeps moving around the parade, and I tell her not to worry. It's probably just observing. The thing is, when I asked her later if any more weird stuff came out, I got the same reaction. Total freak out screaming about not seeing anything and it not being real. It was like the mind couldn't handle the situation and completely melted down. This final one is a bit more interesting. I had let my dogs out at night for a potty break then a head count as they came back inside. Before I went in, I noticed a star bigger than the others. Not being a runner, I stayed put. It got closer and I got a better look. It was a four pointed star with mini points about the size of a pressure cooker, all pulsating different colors. I decided to try some telepathy. I mean, I didn't do anything fancy like cross my legs and say om. I just thought in my head, like you do when you have a grocery list. I asked it if it meant any harm. Give me red for no and green for yes. I got a red for no. I asked if it came from the stars. It turned green. I asked if it was just here for recon. Again, green. Finally, I thought, okay, you can be on your way and it flew higher and farther. My point on the last one is to try to stay calm. It might scare you, but it's the best way to remember what you saw. I didn't get any missing time or the usual stuff like strange markings. It was just an odd encounter. So I'm currently 16, and this happened when I was three. 
I'm from New Zealand. We have this RNZAF Air Force base called Ohakia. Apparently, a lot of really mysterious things happen around Air Force bases, so I'm not sure if this is common or what. But it may be 2.30 in the morning. My dad and mom and I are in the car driving back from Wellington. I have family there. And we're maybe 10 seconds past the base of this tree. Well, it's a tree-like thing. Those big, tall bush tree things that farms use for privacy. All of a sudden, there's a light slowly moving along the tree line. My dad thought it could have been a farmer out trimming hedges, but my mom says, not at nearly three in the morning. So we pull off to this rest area and watch this light. It's completely stopped moving and it's just spinning when another light joins it and spins in a counterclockwise triangle. Maybe two minutes later, another comes from literally thin air and joins the triangle, now having three points, and they just spin and spin and spin. Then they stop, then they start again. After about five minutes, which seems like 10 years, they stop again and stay still for maybe five seconds. Then one flies straight up into the sky and disappears at warp speed. The other two lights just keep spinning when another flies off to the right and disappears. So now it's back to just one light spinning, it starts to move along the tree line again, and then it just flies off to the left and disappears also, never to be seen again. All this started and ended within 15 minutes. After that, we just drove back, but we're all looking around, amazed and terrified. To this day, we've never seen anything else like it. It started on my commute home from work. I got about halfway through the 20 minute walk and at roughly 10.10, I saw these two flying objects that were blinking red and white. I didn't think much of it, being as I live near an airport. That is, until I saw them fly toward each other, hover for a moment, and then depart in opposite directions. It's something that I've never seen drones or planes do before, and it got me really suspicious. I began following one of them, and it kept variating between moving very quickly, slowing down, and hovering in midair. I kept on the trail of that one up until I saw two more on the opposite end of the horizon. I began chasing them down, one by one, trying to get videos and keeping notes on what I'd seen. The main thing that spooked me, aside from the weird movements, was the oblong shape of them. They were just far enough visually that I could only really see the shape through the horizontal row of blinking lights, of which there were three on each flying object. Each one would blink the same pattern, the red lights flashing one after another, and then a white flash at the end, occurring uniformly every few seconds. I only saw them do bizarre movements a handful of times, otherwise I was just chasing them as they sped by. There were at least five of them throughout my entire voyage, all around the town. I would truly love to believe that they were just regular aircraft, but every single thing about them was weird. I took a couple of videos, but they didn't really come out. My camera can't shoot that well in the dark. If anybody can point me in the direction of what these things might be, or what the light patterns might mean, or really anything at all, let me know. It's been haunting me all night. One night, my sister's friend, who we'll just call Sally, was still at our house after my sister had fallen asleep at about 10 p.m. She asked me if I would walk her halfway home, and I said yes. It was just down a hill, and then you just walked one street, and then there was like a cut to over to her street from there. 
But mind you, it's the middle of December and it's really cold. So we walked to the stop sign and we were both like, nope, and turned around because it was freezing cold. We could easily beg my aunt to give her a ride because it wasn't that far. So as we're walking back, we stopped at my next door neighbor's house, which isn't actually occupied. It's completely rusted out. It's actually owned by a sheriff that comes by like once a week to work on it. It's been like that for about the last three years, but my old neighbor lived there for about 20 years before he finally sold it to the sheriff for like $5,000. Anyway, we stopped at the house because we kept hearing weird noises from the side of the house. It almost sounded like cats, so we started calling them. Then they started hissing in a weird way. And then we saw their legs. They were long and skinny and super pale. I don't know what it was, but we just ran to my house and we told my cousin's dad to go look. And he didn't, of course. Maybe it was just a weird cat, but those legs were so abnormal. I've never seen anything like it. And their sound changed when we became aware of it and started calling it. It was like as soon as whatever those things were knew that we knew they were there, their whole demeanor just changed. It was so weird. It was the year 1995, and I was a 20-year-old woman. I worked as a dining room manager at a popular breakfast restaurant. All of the employees would meet once a week at a local bar to hang out. I had to use my older sister's ID because I had just turned 20. I was excited this particular night because the manager that I had a huge crush on was coming. That night, I had decided not to drink too much and that would probably be the main factor in my survival. The guy that I had a crush on chose not to drink either. When closing time came, we all decided to go over to another coworker's house because we were still having fun. As I was leaving to get in my car, the guy that I had a crush on asked me if I wanted to ride with him. He said that he would bring me back to get my car in the morning. I happily agreed and I jumped in the car. As we were pulling out, he decided to do a huge burnout to show off. We got about two miles down the road when we saw police lights behind us. He pulls over and the police officer makes him do the whole, are you drunk dance. He wasn't drunk, but the police officer searched him and found a single pill that was not in its prescribed bottle. They decided to arrest him and take his car. I had told them that I was only 20, but they didn't seem to care. They told me to walk to the gas station and call somebody to pick me up. This gas station was the only place open being that it was the middle of the night. I didn't want to wake my family up, so I decided to walk the two miles back to get my car. I was afraid though, because I was aware that there was nothing open in between that gas station and the bar parking lot that my car was in. I started walking, keeping my eyes open for anything creepy. It wasn't too long before the typical abductor's vehicle pulled up. It was a big, black, windowless van. I was walking northbound, which made the passenger side closest to me. A man who was about 30 asked me if I needed a ride. I, of course, said no and continued on. He continued to ask a few more times, but he realized that I was not budging. I had that gut feeling you get when you know that something is just wrong. He just continues driving at my walking pace. He's looking around nervously. I had no doubt that he was trying to figure out how to get me. I was thinking of what I would do if he tried. I decided that if his car stopped, I was going to run to the other side of the road back towards the gas station. At this point, I was about halfway back to my car. After keeping at my pace for a while, he drove off. For a minute, I thought he had given up, but he just went down a little bit and then turned around and drove past me. I watched him turn around again and head back toward me. 
He pulls up to me again and asks me to get in. I said, no, I don't need a ride. He just drove at my pace again. He would pull off every time another car drove by, but would come back after. Then, as we were getting close to where my car was, I was trying to decide how I could get to my car safely. The bar was in the corner of an L-shaped small shopping strip. There were about five stores on each side of the bar, with the bar being in the corner. My car was right in front of the bar, which was pretty far back from the street that I was walking on. He pulled off again, but this time, he pulled a little past the area that my car was in and parked, turning his lights off. If I had to keep walking straight, it would have been hard for me to get by where he was parked. I decided to count to three and run toward my car with everything I had. I had my keys in hand, pushing the unlock button as I ran. I kept my eye on what he was doing as well. He pulled toward me, slowly, but I think he was wondering what in the world I was doing running into a closed, dark parking lot. As I reached my car and jumped in, he pulled right in front of it. As I was locking the door, we made eye contact. He looked shocked that I had a car. I backed out and took off. I watched behind me, making sure that he wasn't following me. After I got home, I debated on calling the cops, but I thought nothing would come of it, so, regrettably, I didn't. It was about a year later, while watching the news, that I saw him and his van again. He had kidnapped and murdered a young woman. They actually believe he killed more than just her, though. I was devastated. I'm not sure if I had called the police if anything would have changed, but at least it would have been on record. I learned that people looking for victims will often drive around to bars at closing time, hoping to find a drunk woman walking home alone. I really do believe that not drinking that night saved my life. An Oswang is a monster in Filipino mythology that preys on pregnant women. Unlike the grisly attacks usually shown in horror movies, however, these monsters apparently just prey on the life essence of the unborn baby until it dies and the mother miscarries. The scary part is that these monsters are also part human, meaning that during the day, they could literally be anyone. This happened in Metro Manila in around 2011. My cousin told me the old man with the new neighbors asked me if he were pregnant. I was shocked. I never even told my family yet. I was 21 and worked nights in a call center. I never go outside when I'm home and I was only a few weeks along, so I know I wasn't showing yet. How did this nosy old man know? She said the neighbors were new in town, coming from one of the more popular provinces in the Philippines, where witchcraft and oswans are still the norm. They were friendly enough though, so no one really had anything bad to say about them other than the nasty rumors that they knew about Oswan. When I was about eight months along, I was watching late night TV with my brother at around 2 a.m. Something big landed on our tin roof, strong enough to rattle the windows. My brother and I looked at each other with wide eyes as we listened to the footsteps. Yes, footsteps. Stop right above me. I was never a prayerful person, but at that moment, I called on gods and saints and angels and anything to protect my baby. Then I remembered my grandmother's story about how she escaped an Oswang attack by placing a pillow between her legs to mask the baby's scent. So I did just that. We had no idea how long we waited. Seconds, minutes, but then we heard another jump and silence. Until this very day, I'm glad that my brother was with me to vouch for me. I still couldn't believe that it happened and that it happened to me. Then I remembered the nosy old man. Could it have been him? Was he really an Oswang? Something weird and mysterious and unfinished, I suppose, but all's well that ends well, right?
Growing up, my family seemed to have a knack for picking haunted houses or haunted locations. Being a military kid was part of that. We got sent to old parts of the bases that we lived in all the time. One was the entire section of houses, which was haunted by what the wives and my mom deduced was some kind of civil war general. There was one base in particular that we lived on twice in my life. This was the second time when I had studied more of the paranormal and it was really interesting. It was a young house, one of the newer ones, which had been built in the span between when we had moved from and back to the base. My old childhood home was long gone, but my mom still thinks the general makes his rounds. This house had something else. Both my mom and I have a knack for telling if a house is haunted. To us, it won't feel empty. A haunting free house feels more like a vacuum of space. I always get the sense that something will peek around the wall at me when I look through the windows if something's there. At the house we lived in, I would always get the sensation that something was standing behind me. Like in the horror movies, where you see the ghost behind the character, but then they stand up and it's gone. For fun, I called the ghost Johnny, as in Johnny Rebel, seeing as how it was Virginia and probably another Civil War ghost. One night, I was laying in bed, and I heard what sounded like pacing up in the attic area. It was frantic pacing, like someone was unhappy with something or panicked. The activity was ramping up a little, so my mom and I did a mini investigation. We opened up the attic door, and my mom stuck her head up there. Immediately, she called down to my dad, asking if he had put the Christmas decorations up there. He did, and we both shared a knowing look. She took the decorations down, and the activity immediately settled down. When my dad was promoted, we were moved to a new house just a short walk from the old one. My mom came to me one day and said that she had had a dream. In her dream, it was the dining room from the previous house, and a little boy was sitting at the table, dressed in 18th century clothing. She said he looked up and had blood coming from his eyes and mouth. She started yelling at him to leave. She said that he looked startled and said, but I don't want to leave. We both agreed it was an odd dream, and as I thought about it, I looked up yellow fever, knowing that it was a sickness prominent during that time frame that the boy looked to be a part of. I didn't think it would turn up what I found. Not only had there been a yellow fever epidemic in that area in the 1800s, but there were two stages of the disease. If you got the second stage, you would bleed from the eyes and mouth. I told this to my mom, and we came to the conclusion that Johnny was probably not a Civil War soldier, but a little boy who died of a terrible disease and just wanted his space to be left alone. This happened two summers ago. It's short, but confounding. I was with two friends in my truck. I was driving, and it was dark, but not necessarily late, probably about 10 p.m. We were traveling to Page, Arizona, Lake Powell area, from Durango, Colorado, and we had to pass through Cayenta, Arizona, part of the Navajo Reservation. Now, I had been to Cayenta before several years prior with a friend of mine who grew up there. We spent an entire day just having a great time with his people, but as soon as the sun started dropping, his mother and grandmother were insisting that we get off the reservation before dark. I knew it had a reputation for the weird, as many reservations do at night. At least that's what I'm told. Flash forward to this trip, and my two friends and I are in the truck. It's a long, straight, unlit, two-lane road with classic red desert on both sides in the daylight anyway. Not that we could see that at night. There's another vehicle coming the opposite way, 
and there's no crossroad in that stretch. That's important, because right before we go past each other, something I can only describe as metallic went streaking right between us, perpendicular, like feet away from both of our bumpers. It looked to be about the size of an SUV, no lights or discernible shape, but it seemed smooth. It's a weird comparison, but that speeding bullet in Mario Kart is actually what came to mind when it happened. All three of us saw it, and I think the other people did too, because I saw them hit the brakes in the rear view. It was super weird, and I still don't really know how to explain it. This happened a few months ago, and it's really been bugging me. I was out hiking and rappelling with a friend in the hills area near Tombstone. I want to mention that I have spent quite a bit of time solo hiking and camping. I'm used to hearing noises and brushing it off. Anyway, it's late afternoon, and I'm the first one to rappel down. I got to the bottom, and while my partner was getting ready to follow, we heard this noise that I would describe most like a growl or a snarl. It sounded like it was coming from the ridge above both of us. If facing the cliff, it sounded like it was coming from the right side. We both looked around, but didn't see anything. I encouraged him to come down, and I even half-joked that it was probably just a bear or a mountain lion. At that point, I wasn't even feeling that nervous. I figured that once the two of us were together again, we would be pretty intimidating to an animal. While he rappelled down, I heard a loud crash to what seemed to be parallel to me on my left. By this point, I'm starting to get pretty scared, because this sound was getting closer and closer. Somehow, it had gone from right to left, on an exposed cliff face, without either of us seeing it. He successfully rappelled down, and we both agreed we needed to get out of there. We still had a steep downhill climb to the car. We packed up the gear as fast as we could. As we get our packs back on, we heard what sounded to me like a howler monkey. The noise was close, and we still couldn't see what was making it. Of course, it was from the direction that we needed to go. We hauled butt down that mountain and got in the car. I know that it can be pretty easy to let the mind play tricks, but we have the exact same account of what happened. Both of us are really familiar with what's out there, and we've never heard anything like it. Now this is the part that I hesitate to tell, because I know it sounds even more insane. But we both heard whispering and giggling, like it was right next to us, but we still couldn't see anything. I keep trying to explain to myself that our minds just played a trick. The same trick, but a trick. The first noise I would chalk up to maybe a bear or a mountain lion. Animals are stealthy. They could run in front of us without us noticing, I guess. Something else could have fallen to the right side. What made that monkey noise, though? I don't know. And why do we both say we heard whispering? I don't know. I don't know if anybody else has creepy experiences in Arizona. I want to believe somebody was just pranking us, but there wasn't a single other car in the parking area. My friend believes that we experienced something supernatural. I honestly have no idea what to think. In 2014, my grandmother turned 86. She lives in Vietnam, and we live in Canada, but we decided that that should be the year we finally visited. It was my first time visiting my ancestral homeland. We've never really been able to afford a family trip to Vietnam before, but my mom convinced my dad, since she hadn't seen my grandmother, her mom, since 2006 when she visited us in Canada. We bought tickets in April and scheduled for August. Unfortunately, my grandmother passed away in June. It sucked. Hard. Anyway, 
The Vietnamese have this superstition that for 49 days after someone dies, their spirit is still hanging around our mortal plane, waiting to be judged or reincarnated or whatever. So maybe three weeks after she died, one of my aunts was just tending to her market stall per usual. This frail old woman, most likely homeless, suddenly walks up to the stall. She starts talking to my aunt, saying something along the lines of, I'm sorry, sweetheart. I didn't want to leave you all so early. Speaking distinctly in a maternal tone, almost on the verge of tears. It was pretty shocking and unexpected, obviously. Right after she said that, the old woman's whole body shook. A couple of seconds later, this lady regained her senses, looked around kind of confused, and walked off. My aunt told us this when we visited in August, and I couldn't sleep that night, so thanks for that, auntie. They also believe that my grandmother chose to speak to my aunt through the old woman, because frail, weak people close to death themselves are believed to be easier to take control of. That's about all I know about that, but I thought I'd share. My family has experienced paranormal activity. We were living abroad in Southeast Asia, where spirituality is an integral part of life. We moved into a building on a hill overlooking the jungle when I was three, in an affluent neighborhood of the country's capital city. The building had many apartments and one big house at the bottom of the hill, which is where we lived. When I was five, we were hosting a dinner party, when all of a sudden we hear a bang. A guest bathroom, with doors on opposite sides of the room, had shut and locked itself on both sides. My dad had to use a screwdriver to open the lock, and there was nobody and nothing to be found inside. Creepy, right? It gets worse. My auntie came to visit shortly after, and she claimed to see an old woman every night wandering the top floor of the house. An entity my mom told me a few weeks ago she would often see when we lived there. The spirits were not malevolent, but seemed disturbed apparently. Before we left, we got a monk to come and check the place out. He said that the building had been constructed on top of an old Buddhist burial site, something that is not usually allowed and the spirits were not able to rest peacefully. Furthermore, he indicated that the banana tree outside of our kitchen was a hub for spirits to hang out. My parents confronted the landlord, who confirmed that the place was haunted. I'm not very spiritual at the moment, but some odd stuff has happened. My parents now always practice feng shui in our house. We moved back to said country a few years later, and we went to visit the place. I was 12 at the time. Sure enough, the building was completely abandoned and the landlord had put it up for sale. I went on a trip to Cambodia years ago to visit relatives. I was always a skeptic and a non-believer in anything paranormal. To this day though, this is the experience that made me a believer. One night, my dad and I decided to stay at my cousin's house. They have a large multi-level home outside the city of Phnom Penh in a small village named Svai Rolom. The bedroom I was staying in was upstairs and had its own bathroom, and I was excited to get cleaned up before dinner. As I was in the shower, soap in my hair, I heard somebody call my name. I don't respond right away because surely they can hear that I'm occupied and showering. A second later, I heard my name again, this time slightly louder and closer to the bathroom door. 
Annoyed, I turned off the water, grabbed a towel, and answered back, Yes? When I didn't get a response, I opened the door and looked around the bedroom. The bedroom door was closed and nothing had been moved. I assumed that whoever it was, they must have just left. After I finished my shower, I headed downstairs to the backyard where everybody was, and I asked who had just been looking for me because I heard somebody call my name while I was in the shower. Confused, everybody said that they had all been sitting right where they were, just talking. I brush it off, thinking that maybe I was just exhausted from the day. It was a warm night, and there was a full moon out, so we enjoyed our dinner outside. The electricity turns off all throughout the village at a certain time, and it doesn't come back on until morning. So I headed to my room when we had 15 minutes left so that I could get ready for bed. I was exhausted and I quickly fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up to find that I couldn't breathe. I could move, but I couldn't breathe. I was choking for what seemed like a few seconds. Suddenly, I was able to breathe again, and I calmed down. I fell back asleep, only to suddenly wake up choking again. This time, it seemed slightly longer than the last. I panicked and sat up in bed, trying to gasp for air. When my breath finally came back, I stood up and walked around the room, wondering what was going on with me. I had never had an episode like that. I was young, in excellent health. What could it be? After about 30 minutes, I was starting to feel sleepy once more, so I laid down. Once again, I woke up and it was happening all over. I'm gasping for air. I sit up in bed and I still can't breathe. I quickly sprung out of bed and I was still choking. My breath hadn't come back. And just as I thought I was going to pass out, I was able to breathe again. The moonlight was bright and was coming through the window. As I was standing there, catching my breath, I thought I saw a shadow quickly move across the wall in front of me. I sat in bed, and for the first time in a long time, I said a prayer. When I started to feel calmer, I went back to sleep. Nothing happened for the rest of the night. The next morning, I decided not to tell anybody about what had happened the night before. We had a busy day. There was a Buddhist ceremony at the house and a blessing. I was meeting with friends of family and other relatives, and toward the end of the day, I was talking to my older cousin, who's from the United States. She tells me that the monks are there blessing the house because there might be some restless spirits. She went on, giving me an example of the very room that I was staying in that belongs to my other cousin. He refuses to stay in that room at night because he always hears somebody calling his name and pulling at his legs in the night. That was the last night that I stayed in that house. When my family still lived in Vietnam, my sister was led into the ocean by something. We still don't know what it is. She was neck deep, and people kept calling her frantically, but there was no reaction. Somebody ran into the water and had to pull her out. She remembers nothing. My parents took her to a shaman type person, and they said that my sister and the ocean are not friends, and it would most likely be how she died. My parents are refugees. They came over to New Zealand on a boat with my siblings. My sister and my brother almost died on that boat. They're still alive and healthy today, but it's interesting in context of what that shaman said. It's still one of the scariest things that's ever happened to our family though, just watching her walk into that ocean like she was being called.
Back when I was a kid, we used to spend summers on an island called Mindoro. It was an underdeveloped province from the Philippines, and it tended to have folklore around Oswangs. One of the more famous ones was the Nuno Sapunso. It's a dwarf-like creature that lives in a punso, or a termite mound. As a kid growing up near Manila, these folklore weren't something we really believed in. Well, one time, being the kid I was, I pissed on a punso as I was making fun of it, taunting the Nuno. Next day, I had a pretty high fever. A week passed and it never went away. We went to an albulario, a shaman, and he told me that the Nuno got mad and we had to give an offering, so that's what we did. I think my grandma gave it fruit or nuts or something, but I can't remember. After that, my fever eventually died away. It definitely taught me a lesson or two about being respectful. This is my dad's experience. My dad grew up in Indonesia, and he told me about this time that he and a friend were traveling to another province for work. It took a day or so to get there, and after driving their van all day, they needed to spend the night somewhere. They stopped at some kind of local inn and asked how much it would be for the night. The owner said that it was much cheaper that day of the week and asked if they were sure that they wanted to stay there that night. This was because previous guests had said that on that day of the week, they would hear banging on the doors and loud footsteps walking toward the bed they were sleeping in. Well, my dad and his friend didn't believe in ghosts or anything, so they decided to stay the night because it was cheap and better than spending a night in the van. As they started to go to sleep, it was all quiet for a couple of hours until they heard banging on the door, which woke them up. My dad and his friend immediately thought that the staff were playing a prank, so they checked the door, but nobody was there. They were a little bit spooked, but they tried going back to sleep. After about 20 minutes or so, they heard the door handle rattle, and then they heard the locked door open. Both of them were frozen and hid their faces under their sheets. They then heard heavy footsteps, like somebody was wearing boots, walking closer to the bed. Neither of them wanted to look, but my dad decided to rip the sheet off and see what it was. He told me that when he ripped the sheets off, he glanced what was there. It was a figure of a man, maybe in his early 40s, wearing extremely dirty clothing and boots. The man's face was extremely pale, and he just stared at my dad. My dad tried to scream, but he couldn't, and eventually his friend had a look at the figure. They were both just speechless. After a few moments, all they could really do was cover their faces. They went back under their sheets, and when they did, they heard the door slam, but no footsteps leading up to it. After a couple of minutes, they checked to see if it was still there, but it was gone. They immediately grabbed their backpacks and left the place and just kept driving. After that incident, my dad is a very strong believer in ghosts. In Southeast Asian culture, there's a particular ghost or demon that has its head detached from its body. It floats around with the intestines floating around below it, and apparently it glows. If you're Cambodian, you would know it by the name of Arb or Op. I believe in Thai it's called Krasue. You can Google it and get a good picture. Anyway. During high school, I was hanging out with a group of my friends who were all Southeast Asians. We were hanging out really late into the night, probably about 1 or 2 a.m., 
just drinking and overall just talking about random crap in the parking lot of an apartment complex. One of the guys, real tough dude that was physically bigger than us and never afraid to throw it down against others, had to go relieve himself. He went to the side of the apartments where there were no lights. After a minute or so, we just heard this loud yell of, oh shit. Dude literally ran back to us with his pants still unbuttoned and unzipped, with his pants covered in urine. The look on his face was one of sheer terror. We asked him what had happened, and he told us that he saw an op floating around. Feeling pretty uneasy about the whole thing, the other guys pulled out their guns. We waited for not even three minutes before finally just heading back home. When the older folks in the complex heard about it, they mentioned that one of the residents was practicing some kind of black magic and that maybe she had conjured it, but no one's ever really done anything about it. I mean, what can they do, right? Everybody suspected this girl, but no one really knows. The weird thing though, is that she died later and nobody ever knew why. This is my mom's story from when she was a teenager in Malaysia during the 60s. She was the oldest girl in the family with three older brothers and five younger sisters. All the brothers, my uncles, weren't there the night this happened. She doesn't remember where they went. It was in durian season and a school holiday, so my grandfather took them back home to my great-grandfather's house in the Malacca countryside. His house is located on a hillside, surrounded by forest, and it's the only house up on that hill. Our nearest neighbor is about a half a mile down the road. She and her younger siblings, along with their cousins, were looking for fresh, ripe durians that had fallen from the trees at night in their grandfather's orchard, just down the hill. They don't have any flashlights, so they tie up a bunch of dry coconut leaves together to make a huge torch. There are around 15 durian trees, but the oldest and biggest tree is about 200 meters, 650 feet, down from the house. It has a long and large horizontal branch that hangs out about six feet from the ground. The orchard was surrounded by palms, tall forest trees, and a huge bamboo forest. So it's quite dark during the daytime, much worse at night. During a full moon, the huge tree canopy only lets some of the moonlight pass through. It creates quite an eerie atmosphere, especially when there's fog. Anyway, they started searching for fallen fruits after lighting their huge torch. The fire was quite big and it illuminated a large area around them. Her sisters and cousins being kids, understandably excited about the prospect of finding fresh durians, were giggling and running around, chasing each other while searching for the fruits. They found a few fresh durians, but decided to search for more farther down the orchard, toward that big tree with the horizontal branch. My mother was standing right under that branch, her left hand holding up the huge fiery torch, and her right hand holding a couple of durians. None of them were looking up. They kept looking on the ground and searching. She was holding the torch high above her head, right next to that horizontal branch, when it happens. You know the sound you make when you're trying to blow out a fire on a lighted match or a candle in one strong, quick blow? That's exactly the sound that they heard from right above the horizontal branch on that tree. That's when the torch, with its huge fire, was extinguished. No human could extinguish that large fire in a single breath. And there was no chance that it was caused by a strong wind. The orchards were surrounded by thick forest, and there was no wind that night. Immediately when the torch went out, they all scampered uphill toward the house, dropping all the fruits that they had found behind them. They didn't even have time to cry. 
This intense feeling of fear and panic overwhelmed all of them, kicking up their adrenaline. They ran with all their might, and everybody squeezed through the kitchen door. My mother then slammed the door closed and immediately locked it. They all fell in a pile on the kitchen floor, hyperventilating, and then they started to cry. The commotion surprised everyone in the house. My great-grandfather, upon learning about what had happened, immediately recited some prayers and burned some incense to purify and shield the house to prevent whatever that thing on the tree was from entering. None of them could sleep that night. My mother told me that that was the last time they ever went out at night to search for durians. And this is also why they never let us go down to the orchard at night. Back when my mom was a teenager, maybe a little younger, she lived in Cambodia around the 1970s. She went on a boat ride with her mom and some others to who knows where, she didn't really tell me. I guess it was a long trip because she said that she fell asleep. She woke up to her mom calling her name. She realized it was nighttime and they were still on the boat ride. Only her mom calls her by a certain nickname. She decided to go look for her mom while the voice continued to call her. Eventually she did find her mom, but only to realize that her mom had been asleep this whole time. Most people were asleep except the crew. She woke up her mom and told her what had happened. Her mom said that there was a story about people hearing their names being called while they were out on the sea the lake, or any body of water. If the person answers the call, they'll either be spirited away, disappear, or be dragged and drowned in the water. It's a type of evil water spirit. It's a good thing she remained quiet, because neither of us would be here. There are many stories about people's names being called out or whispered. People say that they've been injured. Some say that they've gotten possessed, but bad things happen in general. This happens all over the world, which is kind of wild. Anyway, I've always thought about this story, and I just thought I'd share it. When my friend and his brother were kids, they went on a trip to the Philippines to visit family. Their grandfather there had gifted them a slingshot. Boys being boys, they found a nearby tree outside of the house and started firing away. One of their relatives, I think auntie, told them to stop because the tree was inhabited by a duende. In Filipino folklore, duende can be any sprite-like creature goblins, gnomes, elves. In this case, their family believed that it was a dwarf. Duende live in abandoned houses, mounds, and trees. They can bring good or bad luck depending on how they're treated. It's believed that if you provoke them, they can cause sickness or death. Well, neither of my friends decided to listen to their auntie's warning to stop using the tree as target practice. The next day, the older brother wakes up with a high fever and felt so weak that he couldn't even walk. The younger brother had a cut on his eye that was swollen to the point of where he couldn't even see out of it. Strange thing about the cut though, he said it wasn't painful at all. Their grandpa made an offering, I think it was rose oil, and went to the tree to ask for forgiveness, then applied the oil to my friend's foreheads as well. The swelling subsided and the fever was gone almost instantly. And that's their story about the duende in the tree, who did not appreciate its home being used in such a way.
My family has experienced paranormal activity for a while. We were living abroad in Southeast Asia, where spirituality is an integral part of life. We moved into a building on a hill overlooking the jungle when I was three. It was an affluent neighborhood of the country's capital city. The building had many apartments and one big house at the bottom of the hill, which is where we lived. When I was five, we were hosting a dinner party when all of a sudden we hear a bang a guest bathroom, with doors on opposite sides of the room, had shut and locked itself on both sides. My dad uses a screwdriver to open the lock, but there was nobody and nothing to be found inside. Creepy, right? But it gets worse. My auntie came to visit shortly after, and she claimed to see an old woman every night wandering the top floor of the house an entity that my mom told me a few weeks ago she would often see when we lived there. The spirits were not malevolent, but they seemed disturbed, and I would often see many black cats roaming around the outside. They didn't seem to belong to anybody. Before we left, we got a monk to come and check the place out. He said that the building had been constructed on top of an old Buddhist burial site, something that is typically not allowed, and that the spirits were not able to rest peacefully. Furthermore, he indicated that the banana tree outside of our kitchen was a hub for spirits to hang out. My parents confronted the landlord, who confirmed that the place was haunted. I'm not very spiritual, but some odd stuff has happened in my life, including that. My parents now always practice feng shui in our house, and for what it's worth, they've had really good luck since then. We moved back to said country a few years later, and we went to visit the place. I was 12 at the time. Sure enough, the building was completely abandoned. The landlord had put it up for sale, and to my knowledge, it never did sell. I've lived in Malaysia for quite a while. I spent a significant portion of my childhood there too. Hontiana is a Malay favorite. I remember in 2000 to 2003, an incident occurred in Northern Malaysia that swept the entire nation. It was a Pontiana captured in graphic detail. It's a widely accepted Taoist Buddhist belief that if a loved one dies, in seven days the spirit will return and say goodbye. In 2001, my great-grand died, and seven days later my aunt's maid claimed to have seen her walking around the house. The dogs reacted the same way that they would whenever she was around, too. Jungle spirits are also widely accepted. There are countless entities, but one I will never forget. In the jungle, one must always ask for permission before relieving oneself. One uncle I had scoffed at the idea, and during a camping trip, he disobeyed this. He died of an illness. Strangely, he was the only one of the group who passed away or got sick at all, and he was the only one who didn't ask permission. My mom is Filipino, and this is one of the stories that she told me. In Philippine folklore, the most feared creature is an aswang. More specifically, a mananangal. Think of it like a vampire, but it prefers to eat the unborn. I believe Malaysia and Indonesia have similar creatures, but don't quote me. It's the ones that take on the form of beautiful women, then detach their torsos from their lower body and have wings to fly about. Anyway, when my mom was pregnant with my brother, she took the precautions necessary to ward off the aswang, like sleeping with garlic 
even though we were staying with my aunt and uncle in Oceanside, California. She woke up during the night and she was bleeding heavily. My dad took her to the hospital on a nearby military base. They treated it and my brother was all right, but the doctors informed my parents that they could find no cause and no source for the bleeding. It gave me shivers. There's more. My grandmother woke up in the morning, complaining about how she couldn't sleep, because there was some kind of bird being loud outside her window. Hers is the room next to the one that we were staying in. She said that the bird was making a constant walk walk sound, and this is the sound that the men in Angal are known to make. I'm from Indonesia, and it's 1 a.m. here. My country is an archipelago, almost as big as Europe, with thousands of islands, if you count the small ones. There are many cultures here, and probably as many types of supernatural entities. One of them, though, specifically, is called a Kuntilana. Basically, there are three kinds of entities, man-made, ghosts, or X-man, and non-human. Ghosts vary from your average haunting spirit to something more sinister, like a Pontiana or a Kuntilana. Non-humans are different species from the beginning. Man-made are entities created by people having certain supernatural abilities. These can range from non-sentient drones, to shape-shifting humans, or humans that have mutated into something else, usually as part of a ritual to gain power. Phenomena happen so often here that it's rarer to find someone who doesn't believe in the supernatural than who does. I mean, many would claim that they don't, but true faith is tested while walking alone at night, right? If you go to a school, there's an 80% chance that it's haunted. My junior high, my high school, my undergraduate and graduate school were all haunted. Grad school was the most vivid, as many people stayed up late for assignments. It's common to spend the night at the hotel and hear the occupants of the next room drag their furniture all night long. I've had it happen to me four or five times. Then you'll ask and nobody was in that room. I've heard footsteps walking up and down the stairs next to my bedroom almost every night without an explanation, for months. Other people have heard it too. I've had many friends who can see things as well. One even had a boyfriend who, over time, gained the ability to sense things. I myself could see silhouettes, even in areas of the room where my eyes couldn't see. Like, behind me. I could still see them. It's hard to explain. It's gone or mostly diminished now anyway. All that to say, it is really haunted here. I'm from Singapore. I was lying on the living room sofa in the dark, on my own, just flipping through Reddit on my phone. It was connected to the charger and the plug was right below the sofa, as I had the extension all the way. Then something got caught on the charger cable and the phone got pulled out of my hand and onto the floor. I couldn't see what was behind my phone while reading due to the light from it and the darkness in the background. At first, I thought it might have just been my cat walking past, but she was asleep on my feet. The light that now illuminated the floor showed nothing. I thought I must have just gotten caught on something, so I brushed it off. Not ten seconds later, as I settled back onto the sofa, my phone got yanked right out of my hand again, and this time it flew a little farther away, as far as the USB cable could go. That area was now illuminated, 
but it too showed nothing. Nothing that could have caused the phone to be pulled that far anyway. Just an empty floor with nobody and nothing around. From the small country of Bangladesh and whenever I go to visit my cousins and family members like telling us stories about all the paranormal things that they've encountered or heard about. They don't have any physical evidence but they've all claimed to have had experiences with the paranormal. One of the stories I've commonly heard about are old trees, usually willows, sometimes banana trees, around lakes or rivers. It's believed that when a young maiden dies near the tree, their soul resides there. The deaths are usually drowning, unaliving someone else, or unaliving oneself. It is only during dawn when she said that the souls start to bother people. She said that hauntings behave like sirens do. To men who pass by a haunted tree during the dawn hours, they appear as very beautiful women. To women, they appear as a sad, lost little girl. When someone approaches them, they stay in their form. But whenever the person is at arm's length, they become demonic and angry and try to harm the person. Some people even claim to be possessed by those souls and get exorcisms performed. A lot of my family members are skeptical about the stories and don't believe them. But if they're outside around dawn, I'll watch them go out of their way to go all the way around an old tree near a lake or a river. So, I don't know how much they really don't believe in. I've never seen or experienced this, but I've had several people tell me the same story, independent of one another. So, I thought it would be interesting to share. The most commonly known ghostly figure of Southeast Asia is the Pontiana. A Pontiana is basically a woman who has died during childbirth and haunts pregnant women to rip the child out of the womb. Another favorite prey is men. The Pontiana is able to disguise herself as a beautiful woman and will use this disguise to lure men to their deaths by digging into their stomachs with its sharp nails. I don't have any stories on those, but allow me to share a story that my cousins encountered in the mid-1990s. Malaysia is multicultural, so it's not unusual to see whole neighborhoods with a colorful array of different cultures and religious beliefs. During a particular month of every year, Taoists burn hell money for their departed loved ones, in line with their practice of ancestor worship. The belief is simply that loved ones linger even after death, and by sending large amounts of hell money to be used in the afterlife, the departed can affect your fortunes. As such, getting in the way of burnt hell money is extremely taboo, even for non-believers. It's akin to taking the Bible out and peeing all over it. It may not mean anything to you, but it's highly disrespectful. People tend to adhere not just out of common decency, but also out of a strong belief that you will be haunted and your fortunes will suffer if you interfere. Burning hell money may be your religious right, but there's also etiquette to follow. Responsible worshipers usually burn the money in burners, but sometimes people want to save a few bucks, so they'll burn the money right in the middle of the sidewalk. I have lost count of the number of times that I've had to take a detour because somebody decided to use up the entire sidewalk for this event. My cousins at the time were Muslim and very young. They were not aware of the customs and cultures of their neighbors who were Taoists. It was at that time of the year again where people were burning hell money. My aunt led her kids outside to play and shortly after was horrified to find her two daughters 
kicking and playing amongst a pile of burnt hell money. Things went downhill from there. My aunt started feeling that the air in the house was just not quite right, and she would often find my cousins just sitting in the room, in the darkness, staring at the ceiling. When asked what they were looking at, the eldest cousin would simply reply, somebody's floating up there. It gradually got worse. One night, she was awoken to find the eldest girl screaming and yelling at something to keep away from her sister. But nothing was there, at least nothing that anyone else could see. Later on, the skin on their legs darkened as if it was bruised. They kept telling my aunt that their legs hurt all the time. It wasn't until my aunt visited a local medium, the encounter stopped. I wasn't there, so I can't vouch for anything, but my aunt is the sweetest lady I've ever known. And she's never lied to me before, at least not on that level. So I believe something happened. All this talk of hell money and the like might sound a little outrageous, but being born in Singapore, Stories like these used to scare me, as I was exposed to these customs and practices on a daily basis. Even now, as a full-on atheist, I'm still very wary of stepping, even accidentally, on any offering that's meant for the dead. This just might be one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. My family and I had just moved into a little house, nothing too fancy. We'd only been living there for a few weeks when paranormal things started happening as soon as we entered the attic. It was like we disturbed the demon or spirit when we went in there. Everyone who went up there had a bad feeling about it. At first, I was the only one who realized what was happening. I remember me laying in bed everything a silent stone. I was peacefully watching TV, and then I heard whispering in my closet, which was right in front of me. As I laid there, paralyzed, I remember thinking to myself that I could get up and slowly check. Keep in mind, I was only seven or eight. As I sat there negotiating with myself, I finally was persuaded to go and check. It sounded like at least five people whispering. But as soon as I opened the closet door, nobody was there. The only thing there was all my clothes, but they were swaying back and forth. And it couldn't have been the wind or anything like that, because I checked if the closet doors had made a little wind and the clothes didn't move. This went on every night for about two weeks. Then my family started to catch on. My grandma had been staying at the house visiting and had to sleep in my room with the dog. The next morning, my grandma tells me that my dog was growling at the closet all night and that something evil was in there. After that, the whispers stopped, but the weird noises, things being out of place, and things like that didn't quit. After a while, we got used to it, but that's when things just got worse. This one night, I had to take a shower, and I went to bed as usual. No whispers or anything, I just went straight to sleep. The next morning, I woke up with three scratches down my stomach. I thought it was the dog at first, but this is the weird part. My mom and grandma both described it as if it looked like something went inside me and scratched me from the inside out. At seven or eight years old, I got a little freaked out by that. After that occurred, we blessed the house, but things just didn't stop. My mom and I rode our bikes to the store. And when we got back, we saw a little girl standing in our backyard. So we searched for her, thinking she was lost or something, but we found nothing. Our yard was fenced in too, so I'm not sure how a little girl would have gotten there. Then after that, things stopped. I mean, we would occasionally get a few things here or there, but nothing too serious. A few years passed and we eventually moved out. I don't know what it was, a demon, a lost spirit, I'm just glad I don't have to deal with it anymore.
So there's been running in my attic for about five years, maybe longer, I'm not sure. It happens every single night, and somehow it's almost exactly 5 a.m. every time. My mom and I used to put it down to just a bird or a squirrel that got in through the window, but there's no way that an animal has been living in the attic for five years without a trace, running around at 5 a.m. for a minute or two, and then disappearing. My mom and I hear the running in different formations. She hears it go in a big figure eight and then stop in the center. I hear it run in a figure of eight several times and then run off to the side, go down, go side to side, and stop. I drew out the formation that I hear on paper, and it was 81. I'm not sure if that holds any significance though. We both guessed the age of whatever's up there to be about six by the weight of the footsteps. It runs at about the speed that a child that age would. Slows down, stops, and then you don't hear it again until the next night. We plan to get our pastor involved to give us some advice, but whatever's up there, it doesn't seem like it needs holy intervention. It seems neutral. It seems tired. I don't know what we should do. We've never experienced anything like this before, but we know that there's something up there. I have sometimes heard sounds coming from the attic. We store random stuff there year round and we only go up there about twice a year. The sound is like something heavy is being dragged or pushed across the floor. It lasts for around five seconds, and then it just stops. It's really random. I told my mom, and she said it might have just been snow falling from the roof, but it can't be because I've heard it in summer too. I haven't heard it in months, but it just came to my mind one day it also can't be bats or birds, because those creatures don't make the sounds that I hear. Our house is about 30 years old, I think. I have been living here my whole life, but my parents and older siblings moved here in 2004. All I know about it is that the people who lived here before us built the house, but I don't know anything else beyond that. My wife and I bought a house in the country next to a Civil War battlefield in Northern Virginia. The original property was a 4,000 acre plantation that was subdivided into multiple smaller farms. The original plantation house of the 4,000 acre property was situated on our lot 15 yards behind the house with all of its stone foundation, chimney and well. Our house was built in the mid 80s by hand by the previous owner who worked for NASA and IBM. He passed away after a battle with cancer. We fell in love with this house and property. You could tell it was the man's life's work. After purchasing the house for a great price, we walked the property with his widow and oldest adult son. They walked the entire property and house with us. But what I found odd is that both the widow and the son refused to enter the half unfinished downstairs basement adamantly. This became a long story with too many experiences to list. My wife and I over the course of five years and the friends and family that stayed the night with us all experienced poltergeist phenomena. From the TV changing itself to the NASA space station channel regularly showing up, the cabinet slamming, footsteps heard throughout the house, an out-of-body sound of somebody clear as day whistling for a dog. These things were heard regularly by everybody. Sometimes the whistling would be right over our shoulder, in our ear, almost like it was messing with us. Sometimes while you were in the shower, the same thing would happen which was altogether unsettling. 
One time in the basement, alone, I was painting the ceiling on a ladder. I heard the double whistle right in my ear, over my shoulder, so loudly and clearly that I jumped off the ladder. I backed myself up against the wall to see what was coming. I was so freaked out that I actually ran out the back door to the backyard and I went around the house to get back upstairs instead of running through the basement to get to the stairs. I'm not easily shaken by any means, but that was too much. My dog would always stare and bark at the top corner of the family room. He refused to go downstairs. I would pick him up and physically carry him downstairs only to have him sprint right back up and bark at us from the top of the stairs until we came back up. My wife has had a hand brush across the back of her neck multiple times. Sinks, lights turning on by themselves right in front of us, keys and other important small items would go missing, never to be found again, no matter how hard we searched every inch of the house. I would wake up at about 4.30 a.m. to go to work and I would regularly find the same two doors leading out back toward the old plantation house, wide open with bugs and mosquitoes flying in for Lord knows how long. Maybe all night after we made sure to lock them. We don't know. My mother-in-law was awoken one night by a man's voice asking her, who are you? While living in a haunted house, you really have no choice but to ignore the activity. We got used to it, and it would come and go in cycles. We never felt a bad presence or saw any apparitions. We always figured it was the old owner and would always joke to each other, well, there goes Mr. Copper. But one day, I was home alone, laying on the couch in broad daylight after a long day of work. I heard a bang so loud that it actually shook the entire 3,000 square foot home. It sounded like it came from our large attic. I immediately jumped up and thought one of the large oak trees around the house had crashed through the roof. I sprinted outside to assess the damage, but the roof was completely fine. No downed trees. My second thought was our AC unit, which is in the attic, may have just fallen off its pedestals and crashed through the ceiling. I grabbed a flashlight and scoured the entire attic to find nothing wrong. Definitely no earthquake in the area, and no other neighbors felt anything. It seems like the activity in the house has picked up ten times in the last month, while we're there getting ready for it to be sold. It's been two years since we moved, and we've had no activity since. But not a day goes by where I don't think about the strange activity in the house, and I always wonder what shook everything from the attic. When I was a kid, I would come home from school almost every single day to the attic door being unlocked. I would ask my mom about it and she would just look at me like I was crazy. The house had full-sized attic doors on the second floor. I would lock the one in the bathroom every single day when I got home. Eventually, after my mom said that she wasn't doing it, I just stopped worrying about it because it freaked me out so much but I also used to hear what sounded like footsteps in the overhead attic when I would try to go to sleep. I ignored this as well for the same reasons. I was the only one who lived on the second floor from grades three to 12. I started noticing it at about grade seven and at about grade 10, I stopped checking on it. We never did find an explanation for who or what was constantly unlocking that attic door. Growing up, I dealt with what every child that comes from a military family has to deal with constantly making new friends and losing friends because their parents or my father would move to a new station. This time, we were leaving Arizona, 
and once again, we're going to Germany. But before I, my sisters, and my mother could join him, we had to stay in a small town in Ohio with my grandparents. My father either had to seek out the right-sized accommodations off base, or just wait for base housing to become available. In Ohio, it was the kind of town where everybody knows each other. The kind of town that had corner stores that all the kids loved because they had the best candies, and the owner was just the friendliest old gent you've ever met. The blink and you'll miss it kind of town. My grandparents' house was beautiful, huge, and old. I'm not entirely sure when it was built, but judging by the electrical outlets, light switches, narrow doorways, and old doors with the rustic knobs and keyholes, I'd say it was sometime in the late 40s to 50s. It sat next to a creek that my cousins and I would often go play in and catch frogs to torment my sister with. I loved this house, except for two areas that I would avoid, the attic and the basement with the partial earthen floor, low ceiling, and single 40 watt light bulb to illuminate the one room. I went to the basement just once to check on the laundry for my grandmother, and I refused to go down there ever again. I wouldn't even go near the basement door. Both of those areas just gave me the creeps. The vibes I got from them just put me on edge. I want to say it was just a child's overactive imagination and that my mind was just playing tricks on me. But I would just be in denial of what I had witnessed in these areas of the house. My older sister and I slept in a bunk bed in a bedroom on the second floor that was in the corner of the house, which was above the kitchen which was above the basement. And my mother and baby sister shared a bedroom down the hall, which was adjacent to the staircase. Our little bedroom had its own bathroom, which in and of itself was a pretty sweet deal, had it not been for the fact that the attic door was also in the bathroom. This door was unlike any other attic entrance I've ever seen. It was an actual door, child-sized and in the wall. When it opened, it would creak on its hinges, and there was a hinged set of stairs that you lowered to climb up. This likely added to the creep factor as well. On a previous visit one Christmas, I had gone up to the attic on a dare for my cousins. They told me that there were bats up there, yet had never been up themselves. I was hesitant, but it was during the day, and my cousins were right by the door, so I went in. Climbing up the stairs, I was cautiously looking around, not wanting any winged rats flying at me. And what did I see? A rather large attic that could easily have been another bedroom, a few boxes, my dad's archery set, and a wooden chair. None of this could be considered out of the ordinary, and definitely not scary. At this point, I'm willing to bet that you thought I was going to say I saw a chair move or something, but no. In fact, this was the only time that the chair was worth mentioning just because I noticed it. During our first week, my mother asked my sister and I if either of us had gone downstairs for something in the middle of the night. We hadn't. She had heard somebody walking down the hall from our room and down the stairs. She had called out our names and received no reply. She seemed to just shrug it off and go with the old houses make noises explanation. That same night, my sister was in the bathroom, brushing her teeth before bed. She said that it felt like somebody was watching her from near the attic door. We both woke up later with that same feeling, after hearing that familiar creaking from the attic door. Something was now looking at us from the doorway of the bathroom. We had both seen it, a shadow, standing in the dark. We got right out of there and into my mother's room, telling her we saw a ghost. When she groggily inquired as to why we were in her room, we repeated it, and then she begrudgingly made room for us in the bed. We saw this a couple more times during our stay, but that was the only time we ever hightailed it into her room. The one time I had ventured into the basement, I had been checking the laundry for my grandmother. The washing machine's cycle was done, so I thought I'd transfer the laundry to the dryer. With an arm full of damp clothes, I noticed movement near the wall around the earthen floor. I froze and looked directly at a shadow, walking from one wall and into the next. 
It was bad enough that I was uncomfortable in this basement, but after seeing this, that was enough to keep me out of the room. My sister and I had shared our experiences with my grandparents, but they simply shrugged it off with the old house explanation and said that we were just making up stories to get attention. Then my mother chimed in with her experiences, and this produced an argument that had us leaving and staying with the other grandparents for a time. Soon after, my father had sent for us, and we were living in a beautiful three-story home owned by our German landlord and his wife. Both treated us like their own grandchildren, and far better than our own blood. The only incident to report in this new house was a French nanny who got frustrated and gave up trying to teach us French because we just couldn't get past their equivalent of yes without giggling. Three years ago, my wife and I moved into a house. It was built in the 80s, but it was in great shape and it didn't cost much. We were excited for such a great deal. We bought it and started renovation on it, which lasted about a year. We moved in and for the first month or so, it was great. Well, one night while my wife was at work, I was laying in bed when I heard a little pitter patter. It was coming from the attic and the door was located directly over my bed. I panicked, being a believer in ghosts and stuff, and I ran to the living room and slept there. The next morning, I told my wife about it, who brushed it off as raccoons or something. She bought some traps and put them up there before going to bed. There were no pitters that night, and in the morning, there were no animals in the trap. She reset them and we left for the day. We got back late and went to bed. The next morning, she found a squirrel in one of the traps. Problem solved. She let it out and we both forgot about it. Well, two months ago, it started up again. Every single night this time. It sounds like something small, running back and forth across the floor of the attic. Every time it happens, I wake my wife, who's a very deep sleeper, but it always stops the second she wakes up. She's never heard them and thinks that I'm either crazy or that it's animals again. We've put more traps and she's gone up there and found nothing at all. My sister recently adopted a little girl and when she runs, it sounds exactly like the noises I hear. I'm convinced that there is a little kid ghost up in the attic. I've told my wife this and she's told me that it's nothing and to just forget it, but I can't. I heard it last night, and I know that I will hear it tonight as well. I was talking to an old friend about maybe going on an impromptu ghost hunt this month. And during the conversation, we reminisced about some of the creepy stuff that we had experienced over the years. We remembered a particular event that stuck out with us, and it's one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced. The story begins with my friend, who we'll call T, and myself searching a hidden attic-like space in his house for a supposed stash of money allegedly left there by a previous tenant. Truth be told, I think that was just a story his mom told us to get us off the Xbox for a while. It was the heyday of Halo, and she was probably just sick of us sitting in front of his TV. But whether or not the story she told us was true, we wound up in this small and low-ceilinged attic space, which could only be accessed by a tiny door, hidden in the wooden panels in the wall. We'd known about the door for a while, but had never bothered to go in, mostly because the door seemed like it had been sealed somehow, and we couldn't be bothered with actually using our brains and finding something to pry it open. But the prospect of finding free money in a dusty old room was too much, so we called a few friends to come help search the place. And after a few pries with a putty knife and a flathead screwdriver, we cracked the door open and began to explore. 
At first, it didn't seem like much was in there. Some old clothes and papers scattered about, and a desk in the corner. But through the gloom and dust, we could see something against the far wall, which turned out to be a very old cot of some kind. It was either busted in half or was meant to fold in half, but either way it was folded over on itself, and we could see something covered in cloth and sandwiched between the two halves. Of course, we wouldn't be good treasure hunters if we didn't look at the covered thing, so we start making our way over to the folded cot. I take a few steps forward, and my foot goes right through the floor like it's made of wet paper. Luckily, though T was right behind me, he had very quick reflexes. His hand shot out and grabbed the back of my shirt to keep me from falling forward, and probably all the way through the floor. We took a second to laugh at the situation, and realized that we should probably stick to the sides of the room, as the center was most likely the weakest, and probably the most likely to collapse under our weight. So we tiptoe all the way around the wall of the room, until we get to the cot, where we start unfolding it to get to the covered thing. This is where things got strange. As soon as we touched the cot, the room got very cold, which was odd because we were in an attic in mid-July. At the time, we thought nothing of it. We were certain we had found the stash and were moments away from being rich. So we unfold the cot, which took all of our combined strength from how rusted and decrepit the thing was. Honestly, I was surprised it didn't just crumble to dust at the first touch. Finally, we got it unfolded and found that it was, in fact, a decently sized wall mirror that had been wrapped in a sheet or a thin blanket. As soon as we uncovered the mirror, the tiny door that we had come through slowly swung shut. Again, we didn't think anything about it. Must have been a gust of air or something. We were a little disheartened by the lack of money, but T's mom had sent us in there with her camera to take pictures of anything interesting, so she could see what was inside, since she wouldn't be going in herself. So we snap a couple of pictures of the mirror, the cot, and the random debris lying around. Now here, it's important to note that the mirror's reflective surface was absolutely caked with dust. You could barely tell that the mirror was a mirror, the dust was so thick. Yet the base of the mirror, which looked and felt like it was made of some sort of ceramic, was practically pristine. When I say the base, I mean the part of the mirror in which the reflective surface was set, not the actual bottom of the mirror. I found that to be very odd, as the whole mirror had been covered by the sheet. So why would any of it be dusty at all? let alone just a specific part like that. So we snap the pictures and are about to call it quits when we hear the dogs barking downstairs. That usually meant that somebody was at the door. So we carefully make our way along the walls and out of the room to head downstairs. It turned out to be our friend, who we'll call B, who had come to help us search for the supposed stash. After we told her about the attic room, she wanted to see it for herself. So naturally, we took her up and showed her the tiny door. Before we even set foot into the room, we told her about the crappy floor and to only walk along the walls. Of course, she either didn't take us seriously or she just didn't understand what we had said because she takes a couple of steps toward the cot and falls almost all the way through the floor, practically right through the small hole that I had created earlier. So she's sitting there with her upper body still in the attic and her legs dangling down through the ceiling of the kitchen. It was at this moment that I heard one of the most hilarious sentences I've ever heard. Through the now large hole in the floor, we could hear T's mom on the phone with someone when she said in a very flat and nonchalant tone, I have to go now, there are children falling through my ceiling. So we get V out of the floor and have a good laugh about the situation. And once we're sure she was okay, we all agreed it was probably best to just leave the room alone before we caused any more damage. We get out and all the way downstairs when T pipes up that he'd forgotten the camera and a flashlight in there. So I agreed to go back in with him to grab them. We thought it wouldn't take but a second as he remembered setting them both down on the floor close to the hole when we were helping B get out. But when we got there, we were a little confused. We couldn't see the camera or the flashlight anywhere. 
We looked all over the floor, thinking maybe we'd kicked them around on our way out, or when we were helping B, but they weren't there. We were about to go check if he had maybe set them outside the door or something when we were shutting it behind us, when T stopped dead in his tracks and whispered my name. I looked over, and in an instant, I knew what had made him stop. The mirror was covered up with the sheet again, only this time the outline of the camera and flashlight could be seen under the cover. We stood there and stared at it for a good minute or two before T got brave enough and started making his way along the wall to get over to the cot. I followed on very shaky legs and I watched as he pulled the cover off the mirror to reveal that his camera and flashlight were indeed hidden under the sheet along with the words, help me, scrawled in the dust beside them. It was like something out of a horror movie, and honestly, if I hadn't been there, I wouldn't believe it. The nope factor must have been too much for T, because he snatched up his stuff and made a beeline for the door, with me close behind. We slammed the door shut behind us and never went back in. T's mom thought we were making the whole thing up, until we went back and looked through the camera. We had pictures of the cod and the mirror, both before and after messing with them. One of the folded cot with the covered mirror still hidden, one of the open cot with the covered mirror revealed, and one of the uncovered mirror, which showed no writing in the dust. But there was one final picture, which convinced his mom that we were telling the truth, and that she should never open that door again. The last picture was taken seemingly from atop the cot, and clearly showed the giant hole where B had fallen through, which meant that after T had put the camera down so that we could get B out of the hole, someone else had picked it up from beside the hole after we left, carried it and a flashlight over to the mirror, and snapped a picture after setting it down. That had to have happened very quickly, because we were only out of the room for three minutes at most. T realized he'd forgotten his camera almost as soon as we'd gotten downstairs. The only ones that were there were T, his mom, myself, and B. His dad and older brother were at work, and even if they had come home, they would have had to pass us on the stairs to get up to the attic. There's just no way that I can logically explain the writing on the mirror, and to this day, I still think about what was in that attic with us. I'm 18 now, but from the ages of 3 to 11, my family and I lived in a large four-bedroom Victorian home. It wasn't really the location you would expect a haunted house to be in. We were right next to a busy street, in a row of other houses, all very old though. The house had three floors, as the attic had been converted into two bedrooms, and a large walk-in storage cupboard separated the two rooms. I lived with my three older half-siblings, and so it was very common for us to swap rooms every few months. I had slept in every room, my parents' room quite often as I was terrified every night, the large room opposite theirs, and the two attic rooms. Each one seemed to have its own different type of horror. For the first few years, I was too terrified to sleep on my own. I barely slept, and when I did, I suffered from terrible nightmares, so I would sleep in a camp bed in my parents' room. That was where I had my first encounter with sleep paralysis. I couldn't have been older than six, but I still remember it vividly. A small boy with a paper bag over his head seemed to emerge from the wall next to my mother's side of the bed, and slowly but surely walked around their bed toward me. I remember looking to my side, and there was what I can only describe as a tall black stick figure, like one of those drawings, who was looking above me. I couldn't move, I was sweating profusely, but I knew that I was awake. The next thing I knew, he was crouching down to me, and the boy had reached the foot of my bed. It was at that moment that I managed to let out a scream. I have never had anything as vivid as that happen again but I will never forget it. 
When I was seven or eight, I started wanting to have my own room. I did a lot of reading to distract myself from the fear, and often I would stay up until the early hours of the morning, reading, too terrified to sleep, waking up in the morning with my book still in my arms. I was given one of the attic rooms. By that point, my older sister had the room opposite mine, but she had gone off to university, so I was alone up there. I would never dare sleep without the light on, and to be honest, old habits never die, as even now I still sleep with a light on, unless I'm with my boyfriend. Most nights would be me reading in bed as long as I could, until I just had to close my eyes. It was then that the voices would start up, like there was a couple arguing in the hall. On some of the worst nights, I swore that I could hear breathing coming from under my bed. It got to a point where I was so scared, I had to have my dog and cat sleep in my room with me. But they couldn't settle. My dog would just keep crying, and my cat was constantly spooked. They hated being in there, so I had no choice but to remain alone. The night terrors continued. I'd wake up and I just couldn't stand to be in the room anymore. So I'd creep down to the second floor and sleep outside my parents' door. I don't know how I even functioned with so little sleep. Most times I couldn't have sleepovers, as my friends would complain of being scared and hearing things. My siblings had similar experiences. When my sister had her friends over, often her friend would recount waking up in the night, and my sister was sitting up in bed, still asleep, but talking to the dark corner of the room. My brother would have his covers pulled off of him at night, and my other sister recalled her toes being pinched while she slept. Everyone had their own experiences in that house, even non-believers. My dad recounted being locked out from the outside of the house when he went to the garden, even though he was the only one home, and seeing a dark shadow glide next to the door as he struggled to open it. There were times I would be sitting outside my parents' room at three in the morning, and I would hear the cutlery drawer downstairs being shaken, the TV being turned on for a split second, then turned off, even though I knew that everyone was asleep. I couldn't do anything in that house without the feeling that I was being watched. If I was alone in the house, I would stay out in the garden the whole time, but even then I felt extremely uneasy. I would sit on my trampoline, and feel a pair of eyes watch me from the living room window that looked out onto the garden. Our elderly neighbor told my father the backstory of the house, when my dad would sometimes recount the strange occurrences going on. He told us years before we moved in, there lived a very reclusive middle-aged woman, known to be very cold and unwelcoming. She didn't leave often, only to go to work as a gym teacher. She was known to be sadistic. He mentioned something extremely chilling, though, which was that she had confided in him once that she lived in fear of the house and that she refused to go into the attic because it terrified her. She died several years before we moved. One of the most chilling things was that once she passed, the house was completely renovated. The attics turned into rooms, as I mentioned. The flower beds that Mrs. Evans had taken so much pride in were torn up, and everything changed. The work was mostly done by one man, who had been hired to do so by the local council, who inherited the house, as Mrs. Evans had no family to speak of. Just days after he'd finished up the renovation, his daughter died in a freak lightning accident. I personally have no idea if it was related, but it's terribly unfortunate either way. But the neighbors seemed to think that whatever was in that house certainly did not take kindly to it being changed and decided to take revenge. That's just hearsay, mind you, but it's a little chilling nonetheless. I do believe that there were several entities in that house, including possibly Mrs. Evans herself, but the strongest resided in the attic. I felt things up there that I have never since encountered a genuine feeling of something evil, something that wants to hurt you. I can't even recall how many times people were seemingly pushed 
when going down the stairs from the attic, or whenever my cat, who was usually the loveliest boy, was near those stairs, he would viciously attack you with no explanation for the outburst. The whole house had its moments. It was in a constant state of darkness and bitter cold. But the attic? I don't even have the words to describe what that was. We finally moved when I was 11, and as if by magic, the nightmares disappeared. I could finally sleep easily. We've moved several times since then, and I have never encountered a house like that again. Honestly, I haven't had any paranormal experiences at all that I can think of since being in that house, but that is fine with me. It was enough for a lifetime. I do think it will always be with me, though. Sometimes I'll have the most vivid dreams that I'm back there, and I'm so glad to be there. Almost as though the house in the attic is calling me back. I have so many stories of creepy things happening. So much so that I'd have to talk for hours to tell them all. But I think it's more than enough for now. I know that this story is going to sound like not much, nothing too crazy, but when you experience these things, it's still pretty creepy. There was this one time when I went to bed and I was about to fall asleep and I would hear these loud noises from the attic. It sounded like a box was pushed over and small balls were rolling all over the floor of the attic, almost like marbles. It happened once, and at first I thought, well, maybe something fell down, right? But the weird thing is, it would repeat several times within minutes, and it would always sound the exact same. It was like these sounds were on a loop, and then I would start to hear it often. The same loop of the same sounds. I have not yet found an explanation for it. At first I thought maybe it was snow on the roof, because that could have caused the sound of something rushing or falling down the roof. But it wasn't snow, and it happened when there wasn't even snow to fall down. Just the same box being pushed over and small balls rolling around, over and over on a loop. I have no explanation. This just might be one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. My family and I just moved into a little house, nothing too fancy. We'd only been living there for a few weeks when paranormal things started happening as soon as we entered the attic. It was like when we went in there, we disturbed some demon or spirit. Everyone who's gone up there has had a really bad feeling about it. At first, I was the only one who realized what was happening. I remember laying in bed. Everything was silent as a stone, and I was just peacefully watching TV. That's when I heard whispering in my closet, which was right in front of me. As I laid there, just paralyzed, I remember thinking to myself that I could get up, slowly, and check. Keep in mind, I was only seven or eight at the time. As I sat there negotiating with myself, I finally persuaded myself to go check. It sounded like at least five people whispering, but as I opened the closet door, nobody was there. The only thing was, all my clothes were swaying back and forth. It couldn't have been wind because the window wasn't open, and I hadn't opened the door fast enough to cause any wind. I repeated it again just to make sure. This went on every single night for about two weeks, and then my family started to catch on. My grandma had been staying at the house visiting and had to sleep in my room with the dog. 
The next morning, my grandma tells me that my dog was growling at the closet all night long and that something evil was in there. After that, the whispers stopped, but the weird noises, the things being out of place, that never quit. After a while, we just got used to it, but that's when things got worse. This one night, I had taken a shower and gone to bed as usual. No whispers, just straight to sleep. The next morning, I woke up with three scratches down my stomach. I thought it was the dog, but this is the weird part. My mom and grandma both described them as it looked as if something had gone inside me and scratched me from the inside out. At seven or eight years old, I got a little freaked out by that. After that occurred, we blessed the house, but the things never really stopped. My mom and I rode our bikes to the store, and when we got back, we saw a little girl standing in our backyard. So we searched for her, but we found nothing. Our yard was fenced in. It would have been nearly impossible for her to get in there anyway. After that occurred, things stopped. I mean, we would occasionally get a few things here or there, but nothing too serious. A few years passed, and eventually we moved out. But we still don't know what we might have released from the attic. This is the second time that I've come home and the attic door has been wide open in the dark. My fiance and I live alone. The first time that it happened was while she was at work. I got home from work earlier and went upstairs to change and the attic door was wide open. I had dropped her off at work, so she hadn't been home. She had no way of getting home. The same thing happened last night. I had friends over and we went upstairs and the attic door was wide open again in the dark room when nobody had been inside of it. The thing is, the attic door can only open if you turn the knob. My friend went to the bathroom before coming upstairs and he said that he heard something above the ceiling. We told him the door was wide open to the attic and all of us were pretty quiet for a second. I got the chills and shut the door. Any ideas? I've been reading a lot of people's posts and missing the spirit world a bit, so I thought I'd tell you my ghostly experience from my childhood home. When I was 10, my parents moved the family into a house that was about 80 to 90 years old. The house was built in the 1920s. As a teenager, when I was home alone, I would hear footsteps walking around downstairs at night. I would always hear the faint sound of that 1920s to 1930s party music. Honestly, it was kind of calming to me. I would see people out of the corner of my eyes when walking around, and I always felt like somebody else was there. However, it wasn't a malicious feeling. Except one time, but that's another story for another day. My parents ended up living in this house for about 20 years. I moved out about six years ago. This story, though, happened in 2015. I was in the attic with my boyfriend, now husband. It was a big walk-in attic. It's the shape of a square, with the chimney going right through the middle. The stairs are broken up by a landing. I was on the west side of the attic with my husband behind the chimney, meaning there was no way that the shadow was caused by either of us. We were looking for some wrapping paper for the Mother's Day presents we had gotten our moms. All of a sudden, I hear something walking up the stairs, I thought it was the dog since we left the door open. So I look over and I see the full shadow of a human being on the wall of the stair landing. I'm just standing in awe that whoever this is just showed themselves to me. And I tapped my husband to see if he saw it too. He did, 
and right after he did, it disappeared. I never saw it again, but I always felt and knew that it was there. I'm thinking that this ghost might have decided to show themselves to us since we were moving out right after this happened. Maybe as a little goodbye. I haven't experienced much paranormal activity since I moved across the country, and honestly I really miss ghosts and the comfort that they brought me. Anyway, I hope you enjoy your day, and you can make of this story what you want. I've lived in this house for over three years, and things have happened the entire time. We've considered animals or even a squatter, but we've never found any evidence of either. The attic access is so small and out of the way that realistically only a child could fit. It's a really small tile in the top of a closet. The attached neighbors are pretty quiet, unless the kids who sound like a herd of buffalo are there, but we're accustomed to that. It began with footsteps above the living room of course, we brushed it off as the house settling initially. As we heard it more, we noticed that the steps are clear, and you can hear which direction it's moving. A former roommate was in the bedroom with the access, and she said that her closet doors would shake at night sometimes. We had one cat at that point, and he slept with me. As an old man, he wasn't very into mischief. At some point, she checked the tile, and it was moved partially off the opening. Since it wasn't anything malicious, we just accepted that it was probably here before us and left it alone. This was normal for a long time, with random periods of dormancy. Eventually, she moved out and my fiancé moved in. We took over the larger bedroom and never noticed the closet shaking that she mentioned but we have had a bunch of stuff in the top of the closet, so the tile isn't really visible to keep an eye on it. It was still more of the same until early last year. My vape had the removable batteries to put on the big charger. I figured they were done charging, so I went to grab them, and boom, they're gone. I asked my fiance if he had moved them, and he denied it. So we searched the entire bedroom, and suddenly, we find one under my nighttime water jug. The other was still MIA, so he said, Okay, you got us. Please give it back now. Mostly as a joke. We gave up. But later, it was on the nightstand in plain view. This was the start of things disappearing and reappearing. The most prominent and most witnessed was a few months ago with his phone. Both of us and our roommate all searched the entire house. All the rooms, inside and under the furniture, even the fridge. Suddenly, later, it was laying perfectly on the bed, away from the blankets. There's no way it was missed, because all three of us were in the room. All the blankets were taken off and shaken. I was even laying on the bed to check beside it. After that, though, things changed. We started hearing things down here in the rest of the house, and it feels different. Before things happen, I get that heavy feeling in my gut. One night, everyone else was at work, and I felt it. I tried to tell myself that everything was fine, and that I was overreacting, when I heard footsteps in the kitchen. But then, I felt a piece of my hair move. There was no airflow, because it was pretty chilly, but not enough for the heat to be on. So I got out of there and went to stand outside until somebody came home. Another night we were sleeping and I distinctly heard a man's voice in the living room. Our roommate was gone for the night and the TVs were off. I could clearly hear it coming from that direction. It sounded just like if a show was kind of loud in another room. I sent my fiance to look and he confirmed that no one was there and the house was still locked up. This energy makes me so uncomfortable 
and I still question if this is the same thing or not. A couple of our friends stay over occasionally because they live at home and want to escape. One of our friends said that she's also had some things happen, last night specifically. On a past visit, she said that she was changing in the bathroom, and it sounded like somebody slammed their fist on the door. My cat sometimes likes to body check the door if he's not invited in, but he was knocked out on my lap. They sleep on the couch, and at night, she'll also hear stuff in the kitchen, before I even mentioned what had happened to me. Last night, she woke up to what sounded like somebody holding onto the couch and jumping, like a kid would. My cat was sitting at her feet and started staring at the spot, and then ran away like he was scared. She tried to go back to sleep, but it felt like something was playing with her hair, and she said it was really cold. It was in no way cold last night, and we don't have a heat pump, so it's pretty warm this time of year. I don't really know what's going on, but I'm really not a huge fan of the new things that are happening. The ghost in the attic always seemed friendly, like a child, mischievous at worst. But this, this just feels different. So, I've never been one to say that I believe in ghosts, but there's something here. My boyfriend and I bought a house last year, an old home, almost 100 years old, with a half-finished attic. The attic has this energy. I love it. It draws me in, and also our cat. Our cat would live in this 100-degree attic if we let him. The dog is terrified won't even go up there if I'm carrying him, and he'll freak out and run away if I try. My boyfriend is also scared of it. He says he hears a lot of noises, footsteps. The door up there slams shut and opens with all the windows being closed. He said he'll wake up in the middle of the night terrified of what he hears up there. I could sit up there for hours. The energy just feels, I guess, strong and powerful but I don't really feel in danger. I feel comfortable, but he feels terrified. The cat loves it, the dog hates it. I'm not really into this stuff because I've never really believed in it before, but I'm trying to understand what's happening here. How could the same thing provoke two different results? It's so interesting. So, I moved into this house, and I've been here for about a year now. But about a month ago, weird things started happening. Like I said, my family and I moved into this house a year ago, after we had worked on it for about five months. After we finished, we moved in to the basically new house. We had torn everything up, replaced cabinets, and even gotten new plumbing installed. After we moved in, it was a relief. We had finally gotten out of the moving process. We invite all of our family over for Christmas, one aunt and one grandma. But after Christmas passed, my aunt would frequently ask us how the house was doing, how we were doing, and how our dog was doing. We didn't really find this odd at first. I mean, she's family, and we just moved. So we just figured she was curious as to how we were all doing. But then, I started hearing the footsteps in the attic. Soft, but definitely noticeable. Since I have a tree that's taller than the house, right outside the window, I just thought it was that. After a while, I got annoyed, and I wondered if it was just really windy at night here. I go outside to see how windy it is. Not even a breeze. So then I look into the attic with a flashlight, to see if my mom was up there doing something, but nobody was there. I didn't see anybody. But what I did see 
was a set of footprints in the dust of the attic floor. And the floor was still creaking as I was up there. I was confused and wondering if maybe the house was just shifting. I went up to where I could see the footprints more clearly. I was just super confused. They were bigger footprints than mine. I'm a 12 in men's. So I go back into my room and the footsteps are still going back and forth, back and forth. I fall asleep after a while, but I never forget it. Fast forward about three weeks of this happening. I finally talked to my mother about it. She went up and looked with me and the footprints were still in the dust. Moved to yesterday. I was talking to my aunt and I told her about it. She asked if anything else had happened and I said no. She's very religious for context. She asks if the footprints were bigger than mine and I said yes. She asks if they happened over my room every night and I said yes. Then she asks if I've put salt in the surrounding area of the attic to prevent whatever was causing all the noise and I say no. She says be not afraid, and hangs up. Convinced that my aunt cursed me or something, I guess I'm telling my story to figure out what could have happened. Either she perceived something early on and just didn't want to scare us, or she did something. I'm leaning toward the former, but I just don't know what is happening up there. For context, I live in a top floor apartment where the attics are segmented, meaning that we can't access anyone else's attic apart from our own. I've been having this issue for around a year and a half now. At random intervals each day, I'll hear this scurrying or a scratching type sound seemingly coming from directly above me. For the most part, I chalked it up to rats or birds that somehow had gotten caught in the attic. But I've been questioning this. My family has also heard the sounds, so it's not just me. Last year, I decided to take a ladder and look into the attic. Keep in mind that the roof is quite low, and I also don't trust myself actually standing up there, as the ceiling is thin and I would probably just fall through. I shined a flashlight to look around. Nothing apart from some old chairs, a baby walker that I had as a kid, and just plain old insulation. No birds, no rats, living or dead to speak of. I shrugged it off and went on with my life, still hearing the noises like usual. I feel a little unnerved though. The noises are usually quite quick, but sometimes they can linger. Then, what actually brought on me wanting to tell my story is what happened just now. I'm sitting around and I hear a thud coming from above me. I panic and I ask my mom if she heard it too, and she confirmed that she also heard it and thought it was me. I get the ladder and the flashlight once more, and I look up, this time with more intent, as I move some insulation and other junk out of the way, but nothing. So the question is, am I jumping to conclusions? Is it a ghost? Is there something that could explain both scurrying and a thud with no evidence left behind? I'm starting to get a little worried. This happened years ago when I was about 11, so I don't have any pictures of it, but my mom and I remember it very clearly. The house that we lived in at the time was built in the 1930s. It was a three floor house, but it was all separated into five apartments. My dad and I lived in the rear apartment and my mom lived in the attic apartment because my parents had split up. I was in my mom's apartment with her while she was working on something. I was lying in her bed on my phone and eventually I just zoned out, looking at the wall. 
It was about 11 p.m., and she and I decided to walk to the gas station to get some snacks. The only way to get into the apartment was through the outside door into the apartment or through the fire escape. When we got back, the door and window were both locked. We always checked, so nobody had gotten in while we were gone. But when we got back, I went into where her bed was and sat down to eat. I picked up my phone, and then I just looked over at the wall that I had been looking at before. I saw my name scratched into it. Then I noticed that below my name was my father's name and then my mom's name was halfway carved below my father's. It was really messy, but it was legible. We have no explanation for this, and we have since moved out of that house. We're pretty sure that it was paranormal, and my mom and I are still completely curious about what happened there. I'm pretty sure that something is in the attic, and it wants to make its way to my room. I'm a teenager who's been living under my stepdad's roof for a while. He had a wife before that died in the house, and now I don't think she likes me. Let me start from the beginning. I was making some food because my mom and my stepdad were both not home. It was just some ramen that I was putting in the microwave for dinner. Once the microwave was done cooking, I walked over to it, but a pan fell on my head. Now I know most people would say, well, it was probably not on there right, but this was different. All of the pans were on the wall. That's where the hanger is, which means this pan had to have been thrown at me in order to hit me in the head. Another time was about a month after this. It was midnight and I had just gotten to sleep but then, out of nowhere, I hear a creak in the floorboards of the attic. Now I've seen some horror movies, and in those movies, if you hear something, then you shouldn't go up there. So, I stayed in bed, hoping that it would go away. And it did, eventually. But then what I heard in my closet made me terrified. I heard groans from inside of it. After a few more moments, it stopped but then the creak in the floorboard started up again. It was just back and forth, back and forth, moaning. Stop, creak, stop, moan again. It went on like this all night. I had no idea what to do, so I tried falling back asleep, and I guess at some point I did. The next morning, though, there was a pepper on the TV stand. Now this requires a bit of a second story because my family has a history with peppers. The pepper story started when our late great-great-grandfather was still a kid. He had a mom that died a year after he turned 17. His mom loved to cook and stuff like that. But one night, a pepper appeared on his bed. He asked his dad about it, but his dad didn't know anything. Eventually, the day ended causing him to go back to bed. When he woke up, there were more peppers, almost everywhere in his room. But after they cleaned them all up, weird things started to happen. Things began to fly across the rooms without any explanation. Pans would as well. Stuff like that. They moved out after that. When he had children, the same thing happened to them. And when they had children, it kept happening. After generations and generations, We've always figured that, for us, in our family, for some reason, randomly appearing peppers are most likely a demonic thing. Anyway, I was freaking out and screaming all around because I found this pepper. My parents were out of town, so what was I going to do? Call the police and tell them there was a pepper in my room? I had to wait it out for a week, with the same thing happening over and over. The weird part was, my brother was home with me, but it was only happening to me. And it wasn't my brother. I vetted that pretty thoroughly. I've had countless sleep paralysis episodes since then, too. Almost every night. 
I don't know what's going on, but I need help. So my mom and I moved into a house when I was in the fifth grade. For the record, I'm 25 now. There was this room in the attic that looked like it was actually built to be a part of the house and not some makeshift DIY room. The attic was also not your typical attic with a pull down door. Instead, it had a walk through door. The layout was in an L shape. It was all wooden and the room was obvious at the end of the L. We used the attic for Christmas decorations and whatnot, but I was always really curious about that room. So I turned the room into my little hangout area. It was kind of awkward, so we couldn't really figure anything else to use it for. The only thing in there when we moved in was a wooden table with four chairs and then some weird bench. I swear it was a bed, but it didn't look big enough. My friends and I would always go in there to hang out and play games and whatnot. Well, one day I accidentally broke the table. I was really worried that my mom was going to be mad at me. I don't think she would have cared in hindsight since the stuff was so old, but still. Out of fear, I just grabbed all the stuff I owned and I left the room closing the door behind me. I think I remember once going back in there a few years later, like ninth grade, but I never really spent any extended period of time in there after that. I would always go into the attic though to stack the Christmas decorations in front of the wall and the door to this room. I just didn't go into the room itself. The year before we moved, we decided to move everything into the garage after Christmas. It was my senior year of high school, and that way we wouldn't have to deal with it when the movers showed up. We never used the garage anyway, and we had gotten rid of lots of stuff the year prior, so there was a lot of room in there. Anyway, that was the last official time that I ever saw the door. The absolute last time that I stepped foot in the house, the stuff was all packed away, on the truck preparing to leave. I was doing one last walk through just for old time's sake when I decided to go into that room just to make sure that I hadn't left anything there. I went to the attic and it was missing. Not the attic, but the door, the room. It was nothing but a blank wall. Like there was no way a room could have ever been there. I was shocked and I asked my mom why they had decided to wall it in, but she said she had no idea about it. In fact, she has no memory of this room at all. I called my friends to verify that they remembered the room, and they did. They remembered all the good times we had there, but she didn't. It was really odd. I've never felt anything weird about the room at all either, and I'm pretty sensitive to paranormal stuff. This just seemed like a random room to me, but then it just disappeared. And honestly, I still don't know what to make of it. When I was a kid, I lived in a one-story house that had a very small space that you could consider an attic. We didn't keep anything up there because it was just so small. I don't even know where the entrance to it was, if there was one. But, and this started right as we moved in. After we would go to bed, I'd start hearing footsteps up there. I knew they were footsteps because they would move in a rhythm and move from one end of the house to the other. I lived in that house with my grandparents from when I was eight to 12 years old and this happened every night. I repeatedly tried telling my grandparents about this, but they always said that it was just the house settling. I was never able to sleep well as a kid, 
So while my grandparents would be asleep as soon as 8 p.m. struck, I would be laying awake in bed, staring at the ceiling. It was always the most terrifying when the footsteps stopped right above me, like right over my bed. And then within a few seconds to minutes, they'd walk back to some other location up there. Nobody ever believed me that this was happening. My granddad had even found holes that had apparently been drilled in several of the walls, one in the bathroom, and he wrote it off as a previous owner running cables. I lived in that house for four years and I was convinced that somebody was living in the ceiling above us and would become active when they thought we had gone to bed. I will never forget that. It always happened at the same time of the night too, right after we all went to bed. This was back in the late 90s and early 2000s, so I don't know if there could have been cameras or something that they could have been watching us on, but they definitely knew when we went to sleep. To this day, I'm still convinced that somebody was living up there. Is it paranormal? I don't know. One of the previous owner's kids did die in the house, and they had a wolf-dog hybrid as a pet that had mauled him in the living room. So, who knows? Maybe it was paranormal. But I know footsteps from houses settling. And I know that someone, whether living or dead, was up in that crawl space. So my husband and I have been living in this house for 10 months now, and I don't believe this house has anything wrong with it. The previous owners seemed to be of the lazy sort. The house seems fine, but for some odd reason, every so often, the back garage door will find itself flung open, even though it's locked. Given the state of the property when we found it, we thought they just didn't do basic maintenance and we figured it was something we could fix. When the lock was intact, we were truly freaked out because we thought somebody had broken into our house. But upon further inspection, nothing was missing from the garage and the door leading into the house was still locked and intact. Hmm. So over the course of time, this would happen several more times, nothing being tampered with that we could see and no one being found. But ever since tonight, I've been on high alert and kind of paranoid. I recently had major surgery, so I had some specific pain meds prescribed to me, which sit beside my bed on a table. I had about 10 left, and I hadn't been taking them the past couple of days. I wanted to get off of them as soon as possible. My husband was about to give me one for pain that night though, but looked at me and asked me if I had been taking them because there were only two left. Today, the back garage door was open again. Now, there's a panel to the attic in my garage and one outside my bedroom. Every time we inspect the back garage door after finding it open, it is always still locked, which you can only do from the inside, of course. We literally body check the doors to make sure that it catches and that the wind isn't the culprit behind it flying open. I honestly never find anything out of place, but then again, I haven't really been paying attention to things like that, since I didn't really have a real reason to suspect anything was tampered with before. It's just my husband and I, and I know he didn't take my meds. I've always joked with my husband that somebody could be up there, since we watch a lot of crazy shows about things like that. But now I don't know if I'm being paranoid or if that's a legitimate possibility. We probably would have thought it was potentially something paranormal, but the medication going missing? I mean, what ghost needs pain meds? And how is that garage door still coming open?